Hello! I'm Steve. Hello! That's a bit of a fail. You'll know why I failed in a second. Hello, I'm Stephen Mason and welcome to It's Just a Podcast. And I'm joined with Carl McSorley on the other end of the phone. Hello. Today we're doing the fifth element and I officially am on my third day of testing positive for COVID. So you'll have to bear with me through this. Carl is nowhere near us. Um, and we're going to do Hello. fifth element. And are you ready, Carl? Because I'm going to press play on are you ready i'm ready three two one boop so press and play on fifth element this was one of carl's choices he said um con air all this so i'm gonna let carl rant a lot through this in the background as i probably will cough but um, i've got a lot of love for this in fact did you not get me the steel book of this uh, i believe i did yeah yeah because we're got, watching uh, i got you yeah I was massively dis- disappoint- disappoint- disappointed with this uh, Steelbook Mind. Artwork, yeah, it's nice, but they just de- didn't revisit this movie. They give it no additional love. Um, this movie, yeah. to me, was massive. Um, I went to New Zealand in 95, uh, going into 96, and I just remember being in London for the first time and just seeing how much like PR for this movie was everywhere and London Underground man just like wall to wall all the way down the fifth element the synonymous shot of the city with a uh, yellow font and just like I just needed to see this fucking movie man it's, a, it's an interesting one because at the time I mean you're talking late 90s and I mean it does get mentioned quite a lot by the director that he definitely wanted to go with a completely different sci-fi movie you know sci-fi movies tend to be kind of dark you know space uh kind of you know just kind of a bit grungy whereas uh i always remember this being probably one of the closest at the time to like a proper comic book film yeah yeah you know, they're just absolutely bouncing off the screen and you know the actors are taking it to the next level they're not holding back you know i mean obviously needless to say gary oldman uh stellar performance but uh i think everyone just kind of did something outside the box which really makes it worthwhile to watch i think well it still holds up i think i mean just going into it there before i mean obviously Luc bazon obviously became quite popular quickly because of nikita and um Eric Sara's name's just appeared there, who's a massive, we'll talk about him in a bit. Um, Leon had just been a massive movie, and um, obviously Gary Oldman comes from that as well. Um, Bruce Willis is where we need to talk about, because this film got made, because Bruce Willis, in my opinion at this point, was at the fucking peak of his career, um, the rise, because he had just done um, Die Hard with a Vengeance, as well as 12 Monkeys were films that just came along prior to this. He, Bruce Willis yeah. was really going out there and wanting to change his acting style and uh, taking this, because I don't think Bruce Willis had done much sci-fi, but I don't think there'd been a big, a, big sci-fi movie like this in a while. Um, and obviously this is coming on, like one. this is one of the first movies I think came along which really lit the rocket with CGI, especially in the mainstream, because... Fifth, yes, Independence Day was around at this point and stuff like that, but this just had some funk on it, man. This, you know, Bruce yeah. Willis, Luke Bazan, Eric Sara, who had obviously done the music for Leon, um, Little Nikita, um, Subway, and also um, GoldenEye. Um, as I say, it had been discontinued for a long time as well, and I just think when it got out, I think it just got a quick lick of paint and chucked out, I think. Well, I think there was a, I mean, I might be wrong, but if I'm, I remember correctly, I think the first deal book that they released, which to be fair, isn't a lot better than the contents. It's the same kind of thing. Just a, it was the first deal book and it was a sellout, I think. Um, I think a lot of people, myself included, um, I mean, I love the art on the front cover. That's kind of what drew me towards it. But I think there was a lot of intention of people bought into this purely because the first one sold out so quickly and, like you said, discontinued. So you just didn't know if there was going to be another copy. I say that. I don't say it that often now because obviously with filming and stuff, I've got all the halogen lights. But if you go back to any of my videos from maybe about three or four years ago, before I got the lights, all you would hear me is going, Azim, lights. Do you know what I mean? When like, I was like, and then it's from this, you know, because he's a Azim light. But like Luke Perry, um, he gets the and credit at the start of this movie, which is quite a big build, but. I know Luke Perry yeah. would appear in a Tarantino movie before he died, um, but I, like I just didn't get on the bandwagon. Is he from Beverly Hills or something like that? He was popular for some reason, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Uh, he was 
uh, Beverly Hills 90210. Yeah. I don't know. It's an area code. Uh, yeah, I mean, in America, he was like the dream boat, though. You know what I mean? He was like the, the absolute <sighs> darling of Hollywood when it came to uh, teen girls. Before Leonardo so DiCaprio. I mean, obviously, I never watched any of that sort of stuff, but hey. from what I know, he was very much a case of, uh, yeah, he was shit hot, like, when it came to the early 90s, I think. Yeah, I say there's a lot of information to take in. Um, I've seen this film multiple times, and every time I watch it, you get a different breed of light. Again, we've talked yeah. about this before in podcasts where, um, um, when it's sort of like a French director and American, but this film, even though it's American to me, feels a bit European. There's, it's a very, uh, in, I would say, it's an international movie, especially when it comes yeah. to the cast and. Just the execution um, and the music. I absolutely love the music. Uh, Eric Sara doesn't do enough. Um, it's the same with Mike Mancina, um, two of my biggest f- favorite composers. Um, the Fifth Element scores a double vinyl. Mondo released um, yellow, no, so orange and white splatter sort of mixed dye look. Um, it starts off with a very powerful song that's only used as the end credits, but. I think the futuristic score and that's really good, but there's a lot of information at the start here and everyone will always say the same thing. Why the fuck does the door come down? Why does the guy get his hands stuck? You know what I mean? Like rather than, you know, like someone going, Oh, I'll just open the door for you <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And then even there there's a massive long pause on the wine he's drinking and it's kinda of like is that another joke or something? So. Well, this is it. I mean, this film is designed with, like you said, it's, it's different every time you watch it. There's just so much going on in detail. Uh, literally, if you <laughs> want, I mean, basically, if you go online, there's probably some nerd out there who managed to depict every little meaning behind everything. But I think that's one of the things that I quite like about the film is that it is very much uh, keeping you looking all the time, even though you've seen it. Azim, light. The light. <laughs> Excuse me. At least I'm not Bless coughing. Um, visually stunning. Um, I think that looks it, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it, do, it has held up. up um, as I say, that it got it's got like 4K reissue. A lot of people asked for it. A lot of people, um, and I think originally the origin is at Van Summit, the City of a Thousand Lights. Van Summit with what do you call it came out, and um, for a while that was going to be the Fifth Element sequel. Um, and yeah. I, for a while I thought it was going to be cash cow when this came back out because Fifth Element was discontinued for a good few years um, well from start to finish this was meant to be a trilogy and apparently he condemned it all down into one film but apparently this was the, the intention uh, this entire film was supposed to be stretched out to three um, which is one of the things where I feel like given how much is going on in the film I could see that there probably was a look out, yeah, but yeah. in the same in the same realm, I could also think that might have been a bit much for a trilogy. See, these creatures are like it was funky looking. Like, like a, I'm surprised that's been a bit of that, like animatronics in it, where you you kind of like it's clearly. Uh, I mean, I, this is uh, this is my love for the movie when it comes to stuff like that. I can still really appreciate that when today this will be totally CGI. You know what I mean? That's yeah. the bottom line of it. And this is uh, a bit clunky, you know, obviously, but they look exactly what they're supposed to look like. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about older films, especially in this day and age. <laughs> and, uh, there's a lot of comedy, especially about the whole Azeem Light, and then he, oh, that's better. But well, the whole place is yeah. like illuminated. But again, the Egyptian uh, pyramids. Um, I think that if anyone ever wants to tell a bit of a story of space and all that and they, any kind of myth and mythology, the pyramids is always a good place to start because no one can really like go, where the fuck did they come from? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, There's well, such a like really wonder happy. of the world. I mean, you, can look at, you can look at genuine people out there and tell you where they came from and that sounds like a fucking sci-fi film. You know what I mean? So... And they, like, I mean, it's just that small little key and it's like... Meh. <laughs> But even there, when them doors open in that hallway there, it, it you know it's just a little narrow door, and it's it's not like the whole thing's going to come in like Indiana Jones. But we'll look at that because it's just a movie and it's just a podcast. <laughs> um, as I say, a great choice by Carl today. Um, yeah. But it, it's 
clean. I think that's one of the things as well with Indiana Jones. You get like the fact that it's gritty and it's dirty, whereas this obviously for a room that's supposed to be an empty for how many centuries? Yeah, you know. It's quite nice and clean. It's still, I'm going to agree with you. Like, I have more dust in my house than this in there. Um, again, though, going back to what you see here till what you see later on with the hand and stuff like that is, again, you're right, maybe there was room for a bit more just what's going on because that hand doesn't look like the same hand that gets revived. But then, you know, it doesn't really focus on it much enough for you to take in and go, shit, that's the hand off the fucking thing what got blown yeah. to bits. The stones, and then the fact that later on these stones turn up on the blue Smurf woman, it's like, uh, what? Yeah. So there's a lot of, you know, like again though, this is the era when they were uh, going on about like you know a couple of years later the Matrix trilogy would go along. So it wasn't r wrong or right to say that you know this was maybe pitched as a, a trilogy, but again going back to how successful Leon or the rest of the world, the professional was, um, yeah. the fact that like. He, he got he hit the heights of Hollywood and he kind of does what he wants. Like that one, every director who has that big hit gets their second film literally rolled a red carpet for them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's make or break. And I think he, I think this film was a massive success. I know you'll probably run the numbers in a bit, but like as a director, he seems to have really fall off the map for a while. But then he came back and did Taken. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, obviously, while you're on that, I mean, it was dubbed as uh, one of the most expensive foreign movies uh, to be made. Um, the budget estimate at $93 million, uh, but worldwide it comes in at uh, $260,920,880. So it, 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 it did well. <laughs> so he's about to get crushed. If you have a look, um, see that the, the walls at the side aren't coming in. No. Do you know what I mean? He's like, like, could they not open the door or blast it? Do you know? Yeah. To me personally, that's a big of a boo boo. You know what I mean? He sticks his hand in, his hand gets crushed. There's the key. So he's just yeah. on the other side of that world. Yeah. So why didn't they? You know, they just fuck off. Like I think that's a massive fault with the fucking movie. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things where you are down the fine line of it's just a movie, uh, but I think for a film that is well known for so much detail, I think it opened itself for that scrutiny. The fact that people will ask that sort of question about, oh, hold on a minute, that didn't quite make sense. And it's a bigger deal in this film than, say, most because of the fact that the film itself does pride itself on a lot of detail. Yeah, and it's not always right. I mean, this is. I mean, for a film, I suppose to be detailed. I think I was looking it up earlier on. Um, something about the date or something like that, and it seemed really like nitpicky, but it just said three three thousand years later. Yeah, uh, three hundred years apparently, later. Apparently, based on the date, that's not that's correct. That's incorrect. It's probably I think it's about fifty six. Uh, 56 years ahead of what that actually would have been based on the date that we got at the beginning of the film and where it is now, which is nothing, you know what I mean? It's, it's silly, it's, it's trivial, basically, but, yeah. you know, it's like a little thing like that which makes you think, oh, come on, that would have been in the script, you know, someone would have had to have said, well, that's going to be literally printed on the screen, so we need to make sure that's right, you know? Boom, here comes the nothing. <laughs> Borrowed Nothing from wrong. Never Ever in the Story. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, the most random cast as a fucking world president you can get. <laughs> How are you? Zeus. Now, Tommy Tiny Lister died last year, unfortunately. Um, as a kid, no holes barred, uh, Zeus in wrestling. Um, obviously massive from being on Friday worked loads yeah. he's in loads of films but probably yeah. has one of the biggest list of different variations of his name he's been right. Tiny Lister Tommy Lister Tiny Zeus Lister Lister Tommy Timmy <laughs> Tommy Tilly he's got so many variations um, and this showed him like he can deliver he looks menacing but obviously you know, his eyes always, like, becomes a pun of a joke in a movie. Um, and then we also, there as well, get the guy who was famously in Blade Runner as one of the runaways. 
Yes. But this is out like so I pulled a couple of facts. I think like I say this is quite uh, this is quite funny that they do this. So what does he said? You have twenty seconds. Apparently, if you time it, he speaks for exactly twenty seconds. <laughs> it's just little stuff like that that I think is quite funny with this film. But it's also like check the background kind of movie in it. You know, we, we've mentioned this on a couple of films where like when you're supposed to be looking at the main character, I always like look and then. You know some of the costumes that they've got in the behind the uh, behind the scenes thing. I just thought Ooh, that makes little sense, but okay. Costume wise, I think it's great. I think it's very funky, futuristic. You know, a lot of like aliens and stuff yeah. were very dark or very basic. Um, there's been a lot of funk in here, a lot of colour. Um, you know, I think this film is one of like the last great um, e efforts on. VHS because DVD wasn't around yet. Um, yeah. You know, it's obviously it's one of the last products. But again, like with Bruce Willis as well, um, it is quite an ensemble cast, but was very dominated by Bruce Willis's new film. Even though the support cast is fucking huge, there's a lot of famous yeah. people in the background here and random bits and bobs. Oh, definitely. And I think uh, I think Bruce Willis. You mentioned earlier, and obviously he's coming off shit hot off like Die Hard and stuff like that. And he actually took a pay cut for this, mm. uh, which is obviously surprising. I mean, I don't know if he did it because of the passion or, I mean, the film was already staggering in kind of budget. So uh, I wonder if it was a case of that being the reasoning. But, um, but yeah, I mean, like I say, there's a lot of cast in here. A lot of um, comedies or documentaries I've heard about Bruce Willis um, recently because I've just recently recorded it. Um, the good, the bad, and the what the fucks for him. For uh, well, this will be now the first of the next good, the bad, the what the fucks because this wasn't a part of the first ten films. Um, right. Like a lot of directors have praised him. Robert Rodriguez, uh, Terry Gilliam for the Twelve Monkeys were on about like how well he does and how good it is. But then you just hear some horror stories about him as well. But you're saying right there because at the time um, there was a video game, but I can't remember what it was called. But Bruce Willis was also in a video game about I think it was about Apocalypse or Summit. And that was a um, you know futuristic shooting him up and all that kinds of stuff. Um, so he was getting big and with sci-fi, Bruce Willis like. Yeah, I mean it definitely. Um, I don't know. It was definitely something that had clearly happened in his uh, life, especially like in the later years, because he maybe just doesn't like. Obviously, you do you hear horror stories? But obviously, they're all very accurate to each other. So it's not that you're hearing random stories, like, it's he's difficult, he didn't do this, he didn't like this. Um, but when it comes down to it, I think he probably just, he doesn't have the passion for it anymore, but he probably just does it because he's expected to, and of course... Uh, oh, I'd be making a fucking killing, you'd be making a killing, but... But this is it, it's, it's all a paycheck, and obviously the, the whole term of cashing it in, and stuff like that. Uh, which is a shame, because like I say, you look at his earlier stuff, He's, fucking, he's a good actor, like, he does some really good, uh, kind of, like, his ad living is quite good. Although a little side story about that, which I found quite funny, is a uh, cop-out. Uh -huh. Apparently, um, one of, obviously, Kevin Smith was notorious for, uh, for complaining about how he used to be, but it was really funny how, apparently, Bruce Willis would ad lib all the time, but as soon as uh, any of the co-stars start ad lib, you kick off. He's like, what are you doing? That's not in the script. Well, neither was a fucking thing like you just said, but apparently it's not okay if you do it. I love, uh, he's yeah. got some real quirks here. I love the cigarette. I mean, what a futuristic thing now. <laughs> it's just the opposite side, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's a very inner pun joke. Um, now, I'll have to look this up because I'm fairly confident it's this guy here. But do you know who that voice is? Well, on the other end of the phone? Aye. No, I can't hear it. I know you listen to the podcast more. I actually can't hear it, so... All right, okay. Well, I'm fairly sure it's this one. Yes, it is I, cab driver now. Um, so you'd never believe who it was because he was uncredited as a voice actor. Um, and I imagine he hasn't done very much since it. Uh, but it's Vin Diesel. Shut up. Nah. <laughs> I read that like a few years ago and it was one of those things where I thought... How do you even prove that? Because I mean, unless he's telling people it is, and someone like, because he would uncredited, obviously. So I love it. Okay. Man, guys, crunk there. That, that's really interesting. I mean, I didn't know that. I mean, yeah, I mean, I've been running around. I had this chicken the day. 
uh, around the house and stuff so this wasn't even planned a couple of hours ago um, but I love this skit here when he's about to get mugged and it's because the guy's got like a picture of these fucking <laughs> I mean, that fucking hat and the gun, that's just fucking brilliant. Whoever sat and drew that up on a piece of paper. But you know it's completely funky because I always remember like Bruce Willis, you know, you follow him and like this is the film where you had blonde hair then he would do Jackal after this as well. But, yeah, um, which was very dark. For, even though he did like action stuff, that was like, that was the first time he played like, oh my God, would you call him a villain in that? Well, the thing is with the Jackal, have you ever seen the original Day of the Jackal? Right. So the original Day of the Jackal, um, the Jackal is almost shot for shot a fucking clone, but then obviously they bring the Richard Gere character in, which is a nice spin on it. But like the Jackal as well, I think the Jackal has an amazing score, as well. Um, yeah. But obviously, a big fan of Bruce Willis. But like he, he's made a lot of movies, and not all of them were available. But the recently I've seen Color of Night, and I really enjoyed that. It's notoriously known as the film where Bruce Willis is cock flashes right in front of the screen and there's no like hiding it that's his cock <laughs> you know what I mean? but like the film like, I, I enjoyed it you know it's a bit of a mystery and all that um here it comes with a cab um not many people if you watch especially if you watch our new blood sport video we've just released before this abraham is wearing um corbin dallas's taxi service and not a lot of people get it it's a, it's obviously a fifth element t-shirt yeah which is the best type of t-shirt. I mean, this is a big reveal know. that's, like, coming as well, of the city. So a lot of their... Uh, I mean, there's definitely Blade Runner um, inspiration. I mean, casting one of the actors from Blade Runner is a big giveaway, like, but this is some yeah. of that, you know, like... I think Blade Runner, even when you see the Blade Runner scenes with flying cars, they still fucking hold up for when they did that, you know, craftsmanship. Yeah. Which I would give this a little bit more credit. Because the reason why I say that is because Blade Runner holds up excellently well, but the one thing that Blade Runner gets away with, which uh, these guys don't attempt, is the fact that it's done in such a dark element. You can get away with a lot of work if it's all dark. Where when the fact that these do this, they almost brought daylight. That's where it suddenly becomes a little bit more impressive. Well, especially and with VHS, like you could bold as well to, to go with it. You could hide a lot with VHS. I think you know what I mean. I mean, Laserdisc was creeping around. But like back yeah. then, they, uh, your VHS hit a lot. Well, this is it. I think that um, I mean, obviously, you yourself have a tremendous VHS collection. Um, I can't remember the last time I watched the one, but I always find it quite interesting when you know one of the things is the film itself playing now on Blu-ray looks fantastic. Is it Whereas on the menu screen, the video that's playing looks very grainy. So yeah. I'm expecting to see that scene later on and see if it's actually grainy or whether for some reason it just didn't do the same treatment on the menu screen. Uh, whereas obviously you often think of VHS and think, I think we're spoiled now, I think we forget how the kind of funky VHS could look. I've done a few podcasts on VHS, I think Dream Machine's one of them, um, and I think maybe it's Fast Getaway, because it's the only way they're available, do you know what I mean? So Yeah. Um, I've got a two, couple of whacker heads of these. Stone wacky heads. I've got one of the. Right. I'm not sure how many was ever released. I don't want to look at it because another expensive habit. Uh, but I've got two of these guys, and I've got um, a guard. Um, so there was a lot of a uh, lot of um, promo and press stuff for it, like. But um, you know, these guys are just weird. The great heads, you know, the move. They're quite creepy looking. Uh, but again, you're right, there's a lot going on. I mean, who are these guys? The mercenaries against these guys. And then that just hit the mirror. Yeah. But if you did it in three films, my only like problem here is if you did it in three films, um, at what point, because of how much there is to tell you, especially with the beforehand, are we talking about the first film not even having Bruce Willis in it? You know what I mean? I feel like if you want to explain the origins of all these aliens and where they all come from, I feel like Bruce Willis wouldn't even appear until the second film. Wait, Star Wars, there you go. Yeah. Like it's like it's someone's dream of a Star Wars trilogy, you know what I mean? Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, now here yeah. comes Gary Oldman, who completely is wacky as fuck in this, with half-shaved head, bit of a glass whip around his head, which, you know, it's just rubbing some funk on it, basically, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> Uh, uh, let's have a look I think I've got something on that uh, 
in most shots, Gary Oldman, there is a circle around his head. In fact, a circle in the middle of the frame is nearly constant motif in the movie. Bruce Willis, on the other hand, is more often framed by a rectangle or doorway behind him. Yeah, that's weird bit of fact there. So, I just saw Gary Oldman's name. And originally, I'm going to say Gary Oldman apparently uh, depicted this character um, as one of the up and coming, uh, almost up and coming, uh, the runner up, one of the presidents, uh, runner up, and Bugs Bunny. So there you go, that kind of explained a lot. Yeah, it looks creepy as fuck when that UV hits them there. Like. That UV light. But again, going there, um, obviously when you see the hand, it looks like it's holding something. Again, when you look at that, uh, the structure at the start, it, it ain't holding anything. It's hands are by the side, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it kind of feels like you've missed something out there, yeah, with like, it's our, was it a statue? Was it actually alive? Was it just, you know? That guy with the white goatee, he he always had that goatee in every film, didn't he? Well, he's from Blade Runner. Yeah, yeah. And more recently, he was in more... He doesn't look like the character. I always feel like every time I say him, he just looked like him. You know what I mean? He he was in Mork and Mindy recently as well, so... Nice. I'm watching that at the moment. Um, So basically, the fifth element uh, is Mila Malokovic. Um, Obviously, he's been on and become quite famous from Resident Evil, but all is Cuff's his girlfriend in the movie Cuffs. Um, right. Never seen it. Ah, you need to watch it, it's great. I know. Well, to be honest with you, that's, I, it's always like I see it in the background of your videos and I often see Cuffs and I often think of Heather and those are two villains I've yet to sit down and actually watch. But uh, Cuffs is a, it's a love letter to Beverly Hills Cop Cuffs. Um, mm. The CGI has held up, but I tell you, another film that went a li- above and beyond and I think probably what it came from this is Hollow Man which I think looks mm. fucking stunning on Blu-ray yeah yeah, yeah. Hollow Man went before it's time as well though I Hollow Man's a dark fucking movie man the uncut version because like, at the end of the day why is it uncut for it's all about the rape scene when he's invisible and it's like fuck me yeah. it's Paul Verhoeven it's a guy who did Robocop as well as Basic Instinct there's a yeah. he's, the guy is yeah like a cultural creator, a genius, but he's also a bit twisted, mate, isn't he? Well, he's got Robocop to shoot a guy in the dick, you know what I mean? That was unnecessary. He also did Showgirls. <laughs> he did. Which have also been very famous for if you were a child of the 90s and you watched Saved by the Bell. Oh, yes. Yep. So, anyway, this I was a PG, <laughs> and there is boobs. And this is a PG originally on VHS, because this came out just before the 12 really became a big thing. Yeah. I'll tell you what, Lord. I'll say something very controversial here. Do you think that's also because they're not massive? Do you think you can get away with that? And is that does that just seem stupid to say? Well, I feel it, like obviously she's not massively chested. So at the end of the day, if, to me, I reckon as a studio, someone sitting there going from that angle, her lying down. That's no different to say Arnie with his pecs on the oh, I feel I, like a child mass of boobs. It might I, go down differently. I don't think the shot would have been right like that if she had massive boobs, I think. You know what I mean? Especially if they were yeah. real as well, because they would have like dispensed the either side of her. And um, the hair as yeah. well though, um funky hair. Mm. Obviously Betty Lynch is someone who sports that hair now. Yeah, yeah, man. They're very hard as well because Milo Lokovic doesn't really speak much in here. I think there's a very mime-like um, quality to this um, role. But I'm telling you, uh, like I tell you, who I was surprised he didn't cast is the lass who was getting quite famous at this time. Called in is it Run Laura Run? Um, <laughs> went on to be in Creep, and she was. I think she's in Leon as the stepmom because like. In this kind of movie, you expect if they were to cast someone who was maybe he's French, because um, it's that kind of oh, quality. Like, uh, hot hot yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, at that time, because obviously it's that whole American, you know, foreign side of it. You know, like I just. But again, Mia Malakovich is great in it. Yeah, I think she she definitely 
I, I think it's one of those films where I don't think any other female actress probably would have done what she's done with it. Apparently, she beat out like 3,000 women um, in audition. So, I mean, they definitely must have had her doing some like all this freaky shit in, a, in an audition room to see how, because she's, I say she's fucking out of it, isn't she? Like, an entire, all the way through the film, she's very much a case of. I mean, even though she's got a name like Mila Milokovic um, in Cuffs, she's, do you know what I mean? Like, she was in Cuffs when she was 15, 16, and like. Yeah. Um, you know, so she's been on America for a while, so and she doesn't really have that accent in cuffs, which again, more than welcome to butter. It is on Blu-ray. I have just recently done a podcast for it, so yeah, it's a great film. Mate. I feel like unfortunately, I mean, don't get me wrong, I say it unfortunately because it comes down to oh, tin foil. <laughs> um, the and maybe it might be controversial to say, but like obviously, one of the downfalls is now is that a lot of our work. Is coming from her husband, you know what I mean? So uh, she did a one, Monsters, I think it's called, or. Oh, Monster Hunt, man. Something Monster Hunt. It wasn't a great film, like. No, it, it wasn't. I think I put it down to her, I think, because obviously she is the main protagonist, but uh, I feel like the film was just badly done. But, like, I think her last three films have all been done by her husband, so I feel like she was probably not doing herself any favours by kind of sticking to that one genre where. You know, obviously Red and Evil did a lot of power, but she, I mean, uh, I'm one of those people who just didn't like Red and Evil. I think I enjoyed the first one a little bit. The second one was, you know, you watched it because you seen the first one, but everything else after that, I just kind of tuned off. But, she's you know, um, There's a film called The Perfect Getaway. Have you seen it on the uh, Hawaiian Islands? No, I've never seen that one. So she's in that. It's Steve Zane, Timothy Ondefont, uh, Chris Helmsworth. Um, oh. And it's, like, it's basically three couples... And the film looks fucking stunning on Blu-ray because it's all filmed on the location in Hawaii. And it's right. all about um, three of them, three couples hit the trails. And um, there's basically paranoia. As, um, there's a news report came across and someone's, there's been a couple murdered on another island. And it's all about like, oh, who did it? They're all in the bush. So she plays like the, the girlfriend in that and she's really good in that. Yeah. I think that thing should really blend well with, I mean, I'm not, I wasn't a fan of the female uh, idea that they came up with, but I think she'd come out really well if they stick her in the next Expendables. Oh, yeah, yeah, she's, she's definitely... I mean, she's, earned, she's earned that kind of title, and like I said, I wasn't a big fan of the idea of the Expendables. You know, I feel like a little bit too much of a push. Um, but in context, you could put her with Sly and with Arnie and that, and I think she'll do very well. I love it how they went from uh, zooming in there to a random still that she didn't even make that expression of. Nah. <laughs> and the guy's got glow sticks just swinging to some glow sticks swinging for some reason just oh yeah rub some funk on it that's my new thing and then here we go there you go there's some glow sticks they're just swinging there in the background for no yeah. reason <laughs> yeah. um, CGI I think's held up yeah I love the car you have been in an accident yes I know <laughs> I think if it's well established, and I know it might be a little bit too much <laughs> for a fellow right there, but I officially just died. You know, let's be honest with you. You know, I mean, come on, she jumped that high. I mean, I know she's going to be like superhuman and that, so she died, right? But, no chance of surviving that. It's crazy. I mean, as far it's... as I'm aware, apparently, when she's trying to communicate with Willis, um, apparently they didn't tell Bruce Willis what you were trying to say. So everything you see Bruce Willis react to is him just pretty much reacting to her gobbledygook. But that's no the smart directing all that. Stuff. Like it's, like, I mean, it's, it's, it, you know, it's setting the scene and it's like making it work and the chemistry and like again with Bruce Willis, like. Um, you know Robert Rodriguez and the Planet Terror goes he turns up he's Bruce Willis he delivers he goes and but then like um, Terry Gilliam in the comedy for 12 Monkeys is on about like how you know he really thinks about what he wants to do and again he's got massive range I mean Hudson Hawk I mean that's just incredible but like a lot of people yeah. hate it but again it's acting you know, so big bad bring boom <laughs> one of the only three lines that will actually come up on subtitles. Everything else you say just comes under unknown language. 
have no idea why they picked those two particular wines. But uh, I think there's only like three or four phrases that you say that actually come up on the subtitles. Everything else just comes under foreign language. There's the stare, Bruce Willis stare. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Bruce stare. I I think when you said that now about the whole uh, Vin Diesel thing, because doesn't he not? Uh, it just totally makes sense now. Like you said, you can you can just hear the voice. Yeah, it's just one of those things where when you hear it, it kind of oh, okay. It's one of the things that messes with your mind though, because you're sitting there going, "Am I now hearing Vin Diesel because I now know it's Vin Diesel, or would I have thought of that without that?" And I, I think it's like even at the time, no one can know that because, like you say, I don't even know what Vin Diesel was doing in '97. He was getting oh, around Hollywood. He was. He had a few. Yeah, he he was getting around because you got to remember, Fast and the Furious only followed a couple of years later with Pitch Black. So he was getting around, and he had a few very successful independent shorts and stuff. Well, I mean, not as early as this, but he was in Private Ryan, like so. Yeah. You know, briefly. Yeah, but he was in I know. The music totally changes. It's like one of the funkiest, happy chase musics you're about to hear in a minute. Well, this is it. The whole film's funky and happy. <laughs> Hooks it in. Takes a nose dive. Pretty bitchin' air. Uh, cop helmets, then mine. You know, just about to say the helmet and the guns and everything. The, 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 they've gone with them all. But, um, Judge Dredd. Give me a, a Judge Dredd vibe. But Judge Dredd, what was that Judge Dredd the same year? They're very close, these two films. Yeah. I want to say it, definitely the same year. But... Oh, well, in the. Obviously, you shouldn't be too shocked, but in the process of checking out what Ben Diesel was doing, he's got Triple X4 uh, in production. No, don't need it. <laughs> uh, so let's have a look. He actually started in '95. Uh, did a short film called Multi Multifacial, which could be a very different type of film when you're starting out as a young actor. You know, you might do things you're not too proud of. Uh, oh, hang on, just to cut you off there, the guy I get the takeaway is the guy from Red Dwarf, who obviously famously gets cut out of the second act of. Uh, Aliens. Oh, the, cap the captain. It's a yeah. captain, yeah. It's a captain from Red Dwarf, yeah. Who he's a great. I mean, this just shows you that this would have probably been filmed in Pinewood Studios because he, he gets yeah. a lot of uh, work. But yeah, he always pops up in random films very shortly. Yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, obviously for us being Brits, but it's interesting that he's popped up in all these different things. But again, my brain went straight away. Red Dwarf. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, just to say, he didn't. He, it took a while because he did that show in '95. Um, he was in something called Strays. Yeah, that's that's quite popular. That uh, one, yeah. And then I think I, I think that's one of the ones you know which I used to see in the video shop. I never actually picked it up. I'm sure that's one of them. Uh, and then he went in. Uh, surprisingly, I didn't realise it was that late, but 2002. Um, so he did nothing from '97 to 2002. Which went from Triple X, Man Apart, Chronicles of Riddick, so he basically really took off in early 2000 as the action star. I mean, the thing is, as well, though, a lot of them films were released, so that would affect their release date, um, obviously, riding on the success of Fast and the Furious and Pitch Black, because Pitch yeah. Black was ultimately a bigger film. But, like, again, like, there's a uh, Pitch Black had a lot of um, massive development because, like, they bleached the film and all kinds of weird shit. Um, yeah. So, you know, by the time all these films get made, he would have been jumping around and just, you know, like, it's one thing, like, to have mass, I mean, a film out a year, but then sometimes you just don't get the distribution. That's the word I was looking for. But he was in a really good film called The Boiler Room as well, which I really enjoyed. And I think everyone should see. So if anyone ever rings you and go, hello there, Mr. Mason, and you're like, stop calling me. You know what I mean? It's about cold call and stuff like that. It's a really interesting film, that one. Ah, hold on a minute, yeah, I'm totally looking into his fictitious level. That's probably why it's so Greek. Uh, let's have a look. He's an established writer as well, like Vin, Vin Diesel. Yeah. Or Mark Sinclair, as his real name is, isn't it? Is that, I have no idea, I would not know. Well, he's a twin, isn't he? 
Sorry? He's a twin. Yes, hi, yeah. He's the, I think his middle name's Vin, or it's something, but D- Diesel's definitely not his surname. It's Sinclair. Yeah, that's, sure. a, that's, a, that's a Hollywood name, that, isn't it? <laughs> Aye, uh, so just to, just to correct myself, uh, his first film was actually in 1990. It was uncredited as a hospital oddly called Awakenings. Oh, with uh, Robin Williams and Robert De Niro. Yeah. But, uh... Yeah, that's the thing, like, you just, like, in Hollywood, right, if you, like, I mean, Vin could, could probably come off as one of them things. You just need to get your foot in the door, but like unlike England, like for example, when I had to travel to Bulgaria and all that for the films and stuff, it's kind of like, um, like if you're willing to get your foot in the door and then someone searches at IMDb once you're famous, like like Samuel L. Jackson was like a set designer and stuff like that for people, you know what I mean? Um, uh, on Goodfellas, that's how he ended up being in Goodfellas and stuff like that. It's kind of like yeah. you just get your foot in the door and you learn the game that way. Because that's how you get learn the game. That's how you get the experience of living it. You do every other yeah. job. Bill Paxton's a very famous story. He was a carpenter on um, James Cameron's movie, and that's how he ended up being in Terminator. Do you know what I mean? And look at him now. Yeah. So yeah, it's kind of like he was a carpenter, and you know, just worked out. You know what I mean from his film career. So it goes down to it's not what you know, it's who you know. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, hundred percent. Now, is that, I don't know, you, you wear glasses, don't you? Do, do, do glasses work like that? Because he literally just looked at it from the wrong way around. <laughs> well, that's still there of him holding it without him holding the girl. It's still you get when you open the vinyl. But I didn't even click there, and it's something that's passed me by. Ian Holm, obviously famous for being an alien. Oh, yeah, didn't that pass you by? Yeah, it didn't pass us I by. I mean, when he spoke for 20 seconds, I was like, hey, you're honest. To be every time I think of him, I don't think of Hobbits or the Lord of the Rings because I've only ever seen the first Lord of the Rings. Um, yeah. I think of Existence for some reason. <laughs> right, okay. Have you ever seen that? I haven't. I've seen enough clips to say I know exactly what you're on about, but I've not seen the whole film through. Oh, weirdest fuck movie about role playing, and he's like the fixer and inventor, and they're all twisted. But that's one of the films I know of. This and that, you know what I mean? But I mean, I mean, I'm definitely more nerdy than you. But just out of curiosity, have you watched the first Lord of Rings and not finished it? Well, I mean, I've, I've watched it on VHS. I mean, at the end of the day, I. <laughs> I've been to some of the locations in New Zealand as well, which anyone's listening to that's going to probably drive yeah. them nuts. I don't know. I think it's more the case of I didn't read the books and, like, sometimes to me, like, the films get longer. But I'm and going guys wrong. I've seen all of Peter Jackson's original movies. I love Frighteners. I've seen um, Bad Taste, A Brain Dead, Meet the Feebles, all in New Zealand original VHSs because they were available yeah. rent when I was there. Um, and obviously King Kong. You know what I mean? Yeah. I love King Kong, but for some reason, Lord of the Rings has just never floated me boat at all. I don't know why. Yeah. Just to catch up on the film, did that, I mean, not nearly as bad as the rape scene, but that's pretty creepy, that, though. Like, why he kisses her? Kind of think, oh, there's an unconscious girl. Yeah, I'm yeah. Kiss. <laughs> She'll never know. It's like, yeah. Todd, it's like Todd Phillips sucking on air. Amy Smart's tours for some reason in the bus just for yeah. a glorified cameo. It's just like <laughs> some people have this urge. I only watched Road. Uh, I only watched Road Trip the other night. That's it. why that popped in my anyway, mind. Anyway, I was just picking through my little facts here, and uh, just to go back on ourselves a little bit, uh, we mentioned uh, you know who who else could have played uh, Lee Lou's character, and uh, apparently uh, Elizabeth Berkeley was in the winner. Elizabeth Berkeley. Showgirls, say bad about. Oh my god, I really? Oh, well, I, it would have been the right time, yeah. Made, would have made sense, yeah. I'm just like flicking through there and her face popped up. Uh, but yeah, it's one of those things. Is Bruce Willis in Gottica? What film am I thinking What film am I thinking of Bruce Willis is in with Halle Berry? Because every time I think of Bruce Willis at the moment, I then suddenly go, fuck, he was in that. Oh, fuck, he was in that. Because like, I look around my rooms and I go, fuck, he's in that. And then I was at work and I go, fucking hell, he's in that. He was in a film. Uh, with... 
he didn't two villain with the, uh, the last Boy Scout and Perfect Stranger. Perfect Stranger, there you go. I've seen one of them. Perfect Stranger, not one though. Um, just there, his apprentice is obviously very carry mannerisms of uh, Roland <laughs> Roman Atkinson Mr Bean like didn't he <laughs> right yeah the younger years I shouldn't have kissed her no shit Sherlock that whole thing about points on your license right um, when I was in New Zealand um, my dad was like alright I've put some miles on the car so you can like, take it down to the coast and all that and I'm like what are you talking about why don't you just fill up the petrol station and he's like, no, no, you've got to go online and buy miles. I was like, you what? And he was trying to explain it to us, right? And I still have no fucking idea what he was talking about. Because, like, right. you know, but, like there is just like you cannot drive because you don't have any points. And, like, it's a thing in New Zealand. You've got to pay. I think it's something to do with how the fuel's cheaper and you pay for your privilege of topping up and all that. And it's some of that uh, monitored and stuff like that. And I was like, fuck me, I can't be doing on with that. I mean, it's, it's like tax on everything in America like unless you grow up in it like fuck that yeah uh, well I guess it yeah. it's one of those things where like, I still couldn't get my head around it when I was over there every single time I was disappointed when I when they go to the counter <laughs> so it'll be this much no I don't think it will be shit fucking tax bastards why can't they just do everything like Europe it's fine <laughs> Uh, she's doing an uh, input here, the Johnny Five. Yeah. HP laptop. You know, the, the Apprentice reminds me more of... Um, it could be like a, a Sheldon character from the Big, big Bang movie. Sheldon or the guy, is it Nicholas Hoyt? Hoyt, yeah, that's another one from a uh, uh, British actor. Mad Max and uh, stuff, yeah. Holt, Nicholas Holt. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't. Uh, that's this is it. This oh, to be honest with you, that scene there, that skit is ripped from Red Dwarf. So you know what I mean, because that's uh, the cat walks out fish, <laughs> not fish. Um, <laughs> it's no, it's not. It's not that. It's when uh, Lister puts loads of stuff in the microwave, even splats the sauce everywhere, presses a button, and obviously the same cut. Somebody just takes out the back and passes it through on camera, They're like a proper yeah. comedy gag. So, like, there's definitely, there's definitely a fanboy to, uh, Red Dwarf here, mate. Oh, 100%. I did, I'm disappointed anybody who would ever put anything in the microwave and not go, fish. We're not far oh, away from right. that, like. Oh, fish. Yeah. So, keep in mind, we're, we're getting fairly into the film now, and this is the second time we've only seen Gary Oldman. Yeah, I think, yeah. And this is the first time we see his face, because I think the first shot we've seen him, we've only seen the back of his head. Gary Oldman, I mean, he was just everywhere. I mean, he's such a diverse actor. I mean, this is like Drexel, you know, where he's playing like a, a Rastafarian in a way. Um, yes. You know, he yeah. really carries that really well. Um, he was in a lot of big movies. But then if you look at him in Hannibal, he's almost unrecognisable. You know what I mean? He's a fucking true chame uh, chameleon. Yeah, but he's not. Well, a lot of but like obviously, uh, Darkest Night or what is it? Darkest Hour, what he did with the Churchill. Yeah. Again, I mean, yes, there's a lot of prosthetics, but at the end of the day, if you did not know that was Gary Oldman, and you were watching that, you just think that is just a really old, Germany fat bloke. Oh, right he's uh, he's very, but he's not. He's not scared to take a paycheck. I mean, I've seen him in Guns Girls Gambling with uh, Christian Slater, which is a film straight to DVD. So he's not ashamed to take a few paychecks here and there. Like he's a very credible bad guy. Now the box there, which obviously is missing the handle, which um, is the element holding. I mean, it's a statue. How's it going to be holding the fucking box? <laughs> so there's a bit of a bit of a what the fuck's going on here? These guns as well. I do remember a video game of Fifth Element, um, definitely for the PlayStation. Yeah, well, it was going back to when, because um, obviously one of my first ever PlayStation 1 game was the Die Hard trilogy. It just seemed like at the time that was what was big. Like you're bringing out, like we had Jurassic Park for the PlayStation 1. We had all sorts of, like, kind of seemed to be very popular to do, like, movie franchise games. 
some of these heads oh. of these robots still do the rounds, you know, for um, for sale. But I, obviously the latex, yeah. Are there any good though? No. In contact, uh, like we've all seen the uh, the Donatello <laughs> head that's flying around online at the moment. Seems could obviously see at the moment. You could obviously I don't know if you spotted it, but um, the Universal Monsters. Michelangelo that it's bringing out for the mummy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, that's that's a nod towards that because obviously the first head is just a normal mummy looking head, but then the second head you get with it, it's got like proper exposed teeth and everything. And say like, it looks exactly like someone thought. I know what I'm gonna do here. <laughs> I'm gonna show you what it looks like when a, a turtle head starts to rot. Oh, well, that's it. They don't last. I mean, the second Mr. Pumpkin head we were using for a while, um, which does appear in a lot of my videos. That I mean, I've still got it. It's just a crumbling yeah. mess of plastic, but just doesn't look like it once was, that's for sure. Yeah. Now, I know you just recently watched this, but uh, it kind of, these monsters, they kind of remind me, I think it must be like the scene with a sci fi look, but very much remind me of uh, Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> well, that's one of the podcasts I'm going to do. If you look at the back there, you can clearly see which heads are not animatronic and just paused. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, the, the guy who just came in who's obviously from London uh, the black guy I went to school with a guy called Jay and um, like I never really got Jay's origins but he definitely had a London accent and every time we watched it especially when this came out in school he totally sounds like Jay but he just totally reminds us of it so it's that kind of like breed I think because I mean even though Jay's white he had similar mannerisms especially with the way he looks and he speaks right Interesting. Angel Colossus. Multi pass. A deep, deep swallow. Look at all them guys with the hats on. <laughs> Obviously, it somewhat should have been a Gary Oldman thing, that because of the bloke in the back who's got a similar plastic dome on his head, which just looks fucking weird. Well, that's it. There's like, again, there's no reason why it's funky shaved, you know what I mean? But again, it's just that, you know, sky's the limit, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you want to make it. I mean, clearly, when they've sat down and thought, how are we going to do this? They've decided to go, let's just go. You alright there? Do something completely different because they're just taking advantage, aren't they, really, of all the stuff they've got? There was another few films at that time. There was a film called Space Truckers. That was very colourful and futuristic. And yeah. You know, because in theory, when you think about it, like a lot of the stuff outside is going to be CGI or model work. So set design is a very big thing and costume designs are. So it's kind of like again when someone thinks about a futuristic film especially now and you look at films where where the right was stuff there i mean you know demolition man always seems to have a few things down or a great like the simpsons always gets credit for being advanced of its time but like yeah when you make a sequel when you make a futuristic film it's a it's a clear pad to paint whatever the fuck you want do you know what i mean yeah, like yeah. when you're trying yeah. to do something back in the day everyone will go well that never fucking happened because of this when well, the future like <laughs> who the fuck knows what's going to happen or why or what or what style look at the different style from the 80s to now when people are going to fuck with people wear the hair like that yep that's a mullet um do you know what i mean well, yeah i mean yeah but exactly i mean but the thing is or you look at some people i mean i was talking about this the other day and listen i'm not I'm not a stylist, and I most certainly don't. Uh, the guy on the right, sorry, looks like Eric. Is a man of the head of a time, but there was a lass, and she, I swear to God, from her front portfolio, from her hips to her ankles, she may have had about a 10% pair of jeans on. I'm not talking about ripped, I'm talking about like literally tied them at the button and around the ankles. I could see like every part of her, like, and I'm thinking, what the fuck are you wearing? That just looks fucking ridiculous, but at the same time, it's wacky. And um, people are going to look at it in 10 years' time and go, I can't believe we wore ripped jeans. Well, we were talking there, I didn't want to interrupt you, but the guy who's standing on the right of him 
He rewind that back, literally looked like Eddie Murphy on steroids. He had the bald head, he had the, the thick little tash going on. <laughs> And they're here, space age desk. Um, you know, it looks fresh. Press a button, and then it gets the creepy little monster coming out. But again, if you look at the background as well, if this film was done now, all them stuff would probably be Easter eggs or from the other movie, or you know what I mean. He, he would be a collector of movies, so they would have some kind of random relic, in, depending on what studio did it. Yeah. Oh, there's your Uber. That's the future. I mean, they were right. Them things do exist now. They're just dangerous. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, you got cars that park themselves now. My mum's had a car for two years, you know, she's never pressed the button once. Well, would you, though? I mean, I just don't think I trust that. And I don't know how that stands up um, in your insurance. Like, what if you press the button and... Because technology doesn't always work, we know that definitely in 2022. Uh -huh. um, and you know, if that reverses back into someone else's car, are you covered? <laughs> can you not just can you not just turn around and say, "Oh, well, that wasn't me; it was the car," <laughs> and then then you're getting into a hell of a conversation in court? Then. I mean, I was taught the other day. Um, I seen a clip of a, a jeep that parks at weird, but then the back wheel, you know, well, obviously the spare wheel comes down lifts the right. car up and then swivels so it parks the car it tucks the back of the car in and I was like fuck oh, me yeah, talking about that, yeah. but like now I was, I was forgetting who I was talking to about it and I was I remember the Peugeots and there was a big thing when they had rear wheel when you could like change it and they went what the fuck are you talking about and I'm like I'm talking like <laughs> 90s and then I spoke to my dad he went oh yeah I remember I remember that and now obviously I would have seen it through my dad but like obviously the amount of problems that it causes having rear wheels that actually can be manoeuvred and stuff yeah. like that, so Look at that. Desk that that creature that came out was definitely designed by the guy the from the Flintstones. I'm saying that creature that came out there was totally an off cut design from the Flintstones. Yeah. It literally <laughs> looks like it's fell out the, the Flintstones. Yeah. <laughs> Let <him> down. <laughs> I can do that because I've got code. Split, split stone. <laughs> there you go. It's a bit weird later on when his head randomly bleeds, like the ultimate warrior getting possessed off Papa Shango. <laughs> but, you know, is it weird or is it just clever? That like it makes you think of shit like that while you're watch the film 20,000 times and sit there and go but weird how that happened though <laughs> I mean look at this man this just goes a bit weird here he's like again it's like he's got a fucking camera with an ant on it so again another thing you would probably look at Red Dwarf if you look back to it oh yeah I mean, he's just not the president, though, is he, when you look at Juice? I mean, to me, he you know, was terrifying. You, know, when you look at somebody and go, you know, like, that person could play the president. He's not doing it for us. Now, there's a film that's never seen the light of day, Joe's Apartment. <laughs> ah, excellent. That, that was um, advertised of fuck on VHS. Um, from Stand By Me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. MTV's yeah, yeah, first yeah. film, yeah, yeah. Excellent, had it on VHS. I love that fellow. I was blind by that. There I you go. Um, that's got to be weird. There's Uncle Betty. <laughs> it's five hey, eyes, you prick. <laughs> 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 but again, imagine this one. I right, just come around about six. It's like it takes a Chinese <laughs> takeaway. I mean, would you hear anything being that high up? The wind alone. Yeah, I'll just say it's not practical, is it? But. That's a great again though. I if someone were to come directly to my window and give me my dinner. I, I mean, like, going uh, back to what, you're fired! <laughs> but I love it. Uh, again though, when you think about the future, the sky's the limit, you know what I mean? It's a fucking blank canvas. Well, this is it, and I think that's where this gets a lot of credit, is because he didn't hold back. Like you say, this is like as wacky as he can imagine a, a future can be. 
um, where we've obviously seen some of them where they look like, oh, that's just modern day with a, a weird looking costume. Thing is, since I became a vegetarian, when we order Chinese, it's like I'm very limited because they don't do a ve much variation of vegetarian meals. Yeah, no, you won't do much. Honestly, like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a proper sucker for chips and gravy from Chinese because I think the gravy's lush. Um, but yeah. honestly, God, like all the stuff, just it's all it's very meat driven um, culture. You know, I mean, this is a bit of a weird one for you, but now you brought it up. So what always bugs me, right, is that, I don't know if they just, nobody told them, but like, whenever you look at a, a Chinese menu, right, and you look into the English dishes, it's always got a fucking omelette on there, isn't it? <laughs> Aye. Spanish, yeah. you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, it just always makes me right. It's like, who told the Chinese that omelettes are English? But then it's also like that type of food. I mean, obviously, you know you're vegetarian, so you wouldn't, but... Um, like I always laugh. Like I never thought of like ordering Chinese, and then when you look at um, you look on the English menu and there's always steak. And I was like, I don't know if steak something that you never order <laughs> as a takeaway. Yeah. I feel like you, when you go it, Chinese, you gotta go Chinese food, really. Not long before I became um, a vegetarian, I ordered like a sweet and sour chicken dish, and it was absolutely gorgeous. I mean, like, my um, face was on fire, but it was a nice, friendly fire face. <laughs> and it but was it's like. It's flavour, innit? I think that's where you, that's where you get some credit in, that's flavour. Yeah, and I was. I'm just, like, I was just going to burn your face off just for the sake of putting 20,000 chilies on it. Well, that's it, right? Obviously, that week I went vegetarian and I was craving. So the last meal I ever had with me in was that again. And I was just like, right. I cherished that. I almost ordered a double portion. Um, but I didn't think <laughs> I would stick it that long. It's been, it's been a while now, so yeah. Look at that, man. And do you feel better being a vegetarian? Oh, I'm definitely losing the weight, but it's the craving when I'm hungry, one of the biggest problems. Alright. Carrots don't quite do it, do they? No. Honestly, the last time so I... was a vegetarian, so do you, are you like, you have an egg? Oh yeah, I'm not a full-on cr crazy vegan. But, um... No, no, no. The, honestly, man, the last time I was pissed around the house, I woke up and there were six carrot ends. Apparently I was just eating <laughs> carrots completely off my tits. <laughs> And obviously, I've had a lot of dental work as well, so... You want to wake up half cut and then have half a burger in your hand and go, oh, fucking hell, it happened. Alright. What's with the fucking, um, the Princess Leia like? Well, it's it's kind of like, um, she's like her from Dodgeball, isn't she? It's just like, that weird <laughs> yeah. opinion. <laughs> yeah, the word being used very loosely. Her. Oh, here comes Red. Again, this uh, department, though, it's very inspired by what's going on in uh, China. I see a lot of videos where yeah. there's so much advancement in um, saving space and, like, bunk beds that turn into sofas or just a room and, like, a trap door here, a trap door there, there's a table or there's a bed. There's low I mean, I think I made the mistake of lighting one video once, so now I see these videos every now and again, and it's, like, space creation and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I've always been a fan of like minimalistic stuff, especially when it comes to um, like f furniture and stuff like that. I always feel like it's uh, definitely the future. I always look at stuff online which are like ridiculously expensive, but uh, if it's like literally like a couch that would just like kind of you just swivel it and you turn it and you do all sorts of turn it with table and stuff like that. Even then, there when he's just jumped in there, he he looks like he's rocking a Jedi. You know what I mean? He's sort of got that robe going and stuff uh, like that. Ah, he's got the robe going, yeah. And, and that Obi Wan Kenobi. And that gun just looks like Judge Dredd just had a hold of it. Yeah, well, I mean, don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if I haven't recycled some stuff. Um, nope, don't want the new one, that was 2012. I-1995, uh, Judge Red, so I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of stuff in this been recycled. Well, that's what you do. Judge. See, I think one, one flashy light in the middle would have been enough. <laughs> I mean, how much space must you have up there if she can fit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, she's a slim girl, like, so, but still. Oh, here comes the bed. Imagine that, a bed, that remake. I mean, that does not look comfortable, that bed, like. No, no. Well, anything with plastic on it as a bed isn't necessarily comfortable, is it? This guy who goes, screw you, he looks familiar. He looks like Craig yeah. Conway, actually. Well, not be Craig, because it doesn't ride up the edge for... No. Oh, yep. Put him in a body bag. Coming home with a body bag. Mr. Zorg's office. Yeah. I mean, that's clearly Gary Oldman with his hand up that puppet, isn't he? Oh, He's got about 20 cables, like Richard Orrum. Be a guy right around <laughs> his crotch right now for the shot. See, like, again, though, like, like, you think about when you see, like, if that was a movie now, there'd be blood going everywhere. To there, it's like a big sparkle flash, you know what I mean? That's something that also futuristic, like, the rating and all that, because, like, the bloodshed, you know what I mean? A couple of big sparks yeah. there have been shot dead, you know what I mean? And it works, you know what I mean? Like, I know, like, some people, like, you know, they don't like it, but it works, I like, this doesn't really call for it at all. I mean, Ian Holmes definitely dead by now, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. It's definitely been, like, now worse than that. I mean, when I got killed in the tournament with a plastic bag over my head, I remember saying to the guy, he says, oh, you know, like, for this shot, you're walking towards the camera. It's one of those things where reach it back, but, like, when fucking plastic bag hits you like that man and you can't breathe and all that it's, fucking, it's quite uh, scary like well it's just all about the panic isn't it because let's be honest with you if someone come up from behind and put a plastic bag over your head you know you see them panic and squirm and when ultimately all you really need to do is open your mouth and just press a fucking hole in the bag <laughs> you know what I mean and yeah. that would solve everything but of course you're not going to think like that are you you're just going to be panicky and it was a nice uh, hint of detail there as well. She had a nipple hard on in that shot, which is. Uh, yeah. Well, I should think so. She had a very cold shower. But Although that's the second time they've done that shot, where yeah. two blokes be looking at it and then she's taking the top off and then it quickly moves around. And Bruce Willis is just like, fall backwards. <laughs> oh, that, that was definitely a, a comical. <laughs> and have you seen Hudson Hawk? Um, yeah, but years ago, I'd have a hard time referencing anything from it. I mean, what would say now is this guy dead because he's about to shut the fridge door on him, or the freezer? Yeah, I mean that's it. I mean, I mean they look pretty dead there as it is. So, I mean, behind them there, there's rubbish and all that kinds of stuff. It's like kind of, it is sort of um, establishing that there's a problem in the future, especially with all that clutter and all that. But... Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're talking about it now, you know, we're talking about the fact that we as a, a society are going to have to go back to some form of, you know, recycle system that is our own independent one because China is just not going to be able to take on our rubbish as much. But then again, we've been talking about, like, at work, going back to, like, maybe developing, like, bottle plants again because... Back in the day, you couldn't go from a town to town without buying a bottle factory. Whereas, obviously, glass will last a lot longer than, say, plastic. So, could just be that we have to go back. I love the shot here, like especially when Bruce Willis walks into the shot as well. It's like, but he's totally doing a Mr. Bean here. Yeah, well, he obviously been told just to be like quirky, dopey, kind of zero confidence, but. He's selling it. Oh, there he is. She looks familiar. The last year on the counter, she looked like she could she could have been in something. Not massive, you know, just one of those faces that you kind of clearly been a model. 
to being a female though. Well, the guy there on the left, he's obviously the guy who just got dragged out with his fucking. Uh, yeah, well, it's an just where you them, haven't they? multi-passed but the bit where he just runs and starts digging through the, the garbage and all that but this film's about to shift into a different paragraph because obviously Chris Tucker hasn't turned up yet which you will and so are Lee Evans who I think is really underused in this yeah do you not think it was because like do you think there were we'll have you if we can get you kind of rules so we're not really developing any major story behind them but oh Lee Evans thinks he might be able to turn up on Tuesday um, so we'll, we'll have some. We'll have something for him. No, I think it's too. I think he's too green at this point, um, Lee Evans. Um, but I was just about to say there as well. Um, obviously, Prince was meant to be Chris Tucker's role, but then if you think about Chris Tucker, and you think about uh, Tiny Lister, you think of Friday as well. So yeah, yeah. Aye. Well, this is it because obviously it was um, Tiny the character itself was modelled from Prince and Michael Jackson and they were both considered to be used Prince being the first choice uh, as the actual character but I mean that would have been a bit of a miss because Chris Tucker owns that role like. oh yeah I mean but Chris Tucker's a weird one mate because like everyone goes why the fuck was he never in another Friday and he even he even has a like a, a joke and a pun on um, his stand up, but like Chris took uh, Friday, he did this. He had it. He was in Dead Presidents. He popped up in Jackie Brown. Um, he then yeah. obviously Rush Hour, Rush Hour Free, Money Talks. Um, he's popped yeah. up in Silver Lions or Playbook, but then he's just been completely disappeared. And it's not like he's on drugs or anything like that. He just no. He just doesn't work. He just he doesn't need no. I, I think he just became one of those. I mean, he definitely behind the scenes a lot. I think he did a lot of. Uh, he just became very much a writer and producer and stuff like that. But um, he did just sort of disappear. And I don't know if there was a personal life choice. But he, he, he went. He's a. I mean, he's done some serious roles where he's really good in it. But uh, he just, you know what I mean? It's it's just one of those things. Yeah. I mean, he owns this, and like obviously, you know, like he's got a very Riddler kind of look to him, um, which yeah. again, the Riddler would have been a pop culture then, but I'm not saying he's inspired by it, but. <laughs> no, no, but it definitely, yeah, it was definitely. Uh... But I love the song, and um, the way they use his voice into it, and um, this it's like the all night long bit, um, some of his. Um, Sound clips are actually used on the soundtrack as well. Yeah. Imagine that trying to sell that on eBay. Oh, Ruby, it's just a bit of paint. <laughs> yeah. Well, you see some actual autographs he did, mate. Uh, some of them just aren't what they used to be. Well, that's it. I mean, obviously, the one that come to mind, it's always been a bit of a sad note because the family was definitely, like, kind of draining them as much as they could. But uh, you had someone like Stanley, who was just far too nice, didn't want to say no to people, so he'd always turn up really Comic-Con. Um, did a couple of videos, I think, a year before he died at one of the biggest Comic-Con. And it was shit, like, because it's not like me or you taking a DVD or taking a memorabilia and having to sign it. Some of these people were taking, like, 20-odd things to sign. Yeah. And you know the fact that the matter is they're all getting put online an hour later to be sold. But, like, you could see, like, where certain blokes were going back to, I need him to, I need him to sign that. All he's done is a squiggle. He's just done a line. Not... I was like, because he's fucking doing, like, 20 hours, probably. And he can barely stand up, and you ask him to sign a perfect signature every time. I'm to, um, you weren't up for the love of horror, were you? Because I, because me and Brit witnessed somebody complaining about that. Because obviously, it, for the love of horror, they had the the cast of it there, and they had them all on the panel. Yes. And obviously, you could pre-order Tim Curry's signature, and like obviously, yeah, you just did a batch. Yeah. And this guy was like, well, no, I'm not having this. And like, I think it was the last one. So they were like, well, it's the only one we've got left. He was like, well, I'm not happy with this. And I'm like, well, what are you going to do? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a dodgy line. It's a really dodgy line because the reality is it wouldn't have been cheap. So on one half, you can kind of say, well, as a consumer, I get it. I get why you'd be upset with that. 
um, especially if you didn't see him sign it, which again, which is another thing. Obviously, he's not going to be able to do them in person. Obviously, it's not as much in any way. Um, so it's not like you can sit there and go, I had a photograph with him signing something. You're just kind of thinking that doesn't really add up to what I paid for. But at the same time, this is where you get that line of should he really just pack in if you can't do it as much as you could or if you can't do it as well. <laughs> I mean, it's going to drive the prices right up, but if you turn around to say, right, I'm strictly limiting myself to 50 autographs per Comic-Con or whatever it is, and just be done with it, and it'd be like, people will piss off because it'll be really high high end to get a hold of, but at the end of the day, man, it's just such a, it's a greedy world out there. Yeah. Look at the protocol. So not actually going into it, but uh, there is a little segment saying here, um, apparently, uh, Chris Tucker had a couple of personal issues. That's pretty much all this is. Chris Tucker had a number of personal issues which caused him to step back from the spotlight following the release of Rush Hour 3. He earned a staggering amount of money, in excess of $60 million. Um, he simply did not need to work for an extended period of time. So but there is a thing as well, um, I'm not sure what it is now, but when you're in mainstream, I think if you're paying in the box office and it's something when you go in especially through agencies but like if you get a million pound for a movie then someone says oh will you be in this movie for 500 grand and like you've got the like it's like a minimum wage it's it's your rate do you know what i mean it's classes of pay and stuff like that so like if you're in like you can bring it to the table and go until you fuck it up you can go, well, no, not really. I got paid 10 million off my last movie and made this much money. You want me to be in that much money? And then it's a whole like, oh, you get percentages back and you get off cuts and all this kind of stuff. It's all wheel and deal. But like, I again, it's 60 million was just what he got paid for the film. That's not talking about the press that he did. It's not talking about all the extras, the, the, uh, the adverts, the interviews and stuff like that. So yeah, he probably would have getting paid a pretty penny, though. Um, just between me and Carl obviously on this podcast but at the moment I'm doing uh, some archiving backup and I've just got to February of last year in Abraham in the Bible file is transferred it is 36.5 gigabytes the file <laughs> I mean there's a lot of footage that's, that's not just a video that you made that's like years and years of work in it no, that's just uh, well. That's just obviously what was filmed for the Bible and all the uh, the offcuts. Um, I always laughed at this bit when the spray. The props here are clearly them jitter balls that used to bounce along the floor, which when they fall, you'll know what I mean. Little toy you used to get when you put the batteries on used to vibrate along the floor. Um, just one of them dressed up with some slime. Right. There you go. One's about to fall down on the floor here. There you go. That's all they are. Load oh, of the, oh, just yeah. load of them balls just like, dressed up. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have thought that, but now that you said that. I mean, uh, talk about like stereotypical girl. There's a Jamaican in charge of nuclear fest <laughs> smoking a spliff whilst, <laughs> while she gets a licked out on a plane and you go, why is this film a PG? I mean, I could say they're having at it as well, I so... It definitely would be a 15 and if it was made now, I reckon. Or do you think it would still make a 12? I think it is a 12 now, you know. I think it's been reclassed. Uh, I was going to say, I would have thought, I would have thought 15, nudity, nudity alone, you know what I mean? Um, sexual, sexual references. But again, the 12 wasn't around really. Well, it was because Ace Ventura was one of the first 12s and that was like 92 when that came out, 93. <laughs> Do you think this is so goofy that they just didn't think anyone would take it serious? Again, it's politics though, you know what I mean? It's one of those things where you need it to be a certain time to play for certain, get the maximum amount of showings in a day. Uh, you need it to be a 12A PG for the maximum uh, audience you can take in, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Was. So it was like going up with the plane, going up, I like it. And yeah, he was the head, his head starts to bleed here, isn't it? Very stressed. Now, if I'm correct, Bruce Willis and Gary Oldman never actually share screen time, did they? I don't think so. 
Richard Harrier news. I love it there though, right? He's like, that's just blown up there, right? And if you like watch that back, and like now images are so fucking crystal clear, he's still standing there holding the phone while the entire thing's blown up around him. So it's obviously <laughs> meant, it's obviously a standing statue, and then obviously yeah. it blows up, and that thing is still fucking standing there. That spaceship is very modern day looking spaceship for a film like this, isn't it? Uh, I mean, those spaceships on the screen there, they look like spaceship. The one that just flew off, that looked like a rocket, like an actual NASA. I mean, I know it wasn't a NASA rocket, but like, strangely that the one with that design on everything else looks look, so spacecrafty. Look at the engineers in the background, they look like Spider Man, they've got a red and blue suit on. <laughs> yeah. So you're talking about explosions and things not quite looking the same afterwards. Uh, my all-time favourite and it cannot be touched I don't care what you say there's not another one out there that looks as bad uh, but if you ever watch Commando um, towards the end um, there's building blowing up and it literally they're just they're literally mannequins just standing there <laughs> it's just like obviously being pegged into the ground and like obviously I've watched it on Blu-ray not that long ago and I was just sitting there going this is awful I mean the film is great for what it is but like there's just no there's nothing you can do CGI yeah. or not it's just it is what it is well, unless I, I mean thought, this is just weirdly bad to look at again you talk about that when you just need to look at um, the availability of when you do stuff like that because look at Lethal Weapon 2 where they're just piggybacked onto the fact that a building was getting blown up it's the same with Demolition Man um, yeah that building was getting they basically like buy the rights to blow it up and you know what I mean any government goes right we need to get rid of this building um, it's going to cost X amount oh this film wants to film it for a film and they'll pay like yeah. half the money and then the gov- like, you know what I mean it's one of those things where you don't get a good unless you've got a big budget now it's all just CGI and I still don't think fire CGI looks right I was, gonna, I was just about to say you do not like fire CGI idea. <laughs> no, well, I watched a film last night and it was pretty bad. It was Population 463 or four, uh, whoever calls a film with a triple barrel number after it's always looking for trouble because people won't remember it. <laughs> um, the Fred Durst movie when Fred Durst is like a, a sheriff in a small town and the guy comes for a censor and it's all like fucking hell like don't let anyone in and like if anyone comes in the town they've got to go and kill one of the other members of staff to keep the population the same thing and at the right. end he sets fire to this barn and as soon as he put the match down I was like oh my god that looks fucking terrible and they're all running away yeah. going oh there's like there's one thing reacting to the fire and some are blowing up and another thing I mean I've probably told you this story before about when they blew the truck up in the tournament and I was sitting on the rooftop in the middle of the night was some of the cast because like we were told to be a mile away from it and when that thing fucking blew I felt a shockwave and I was a mile away and like the echo and the sound boom set every alarm off and like if you're an actor reacting to that you're going to fucking react to that not go oh bang (laughs) just going back there I mean there's no real like wound for him to be bleeding from his head the way he was oh no it's totally uh, that's why I said Papa Shango Ultimate Warrior yeah yeah I'd expect it to have come from the hairline at least and then you could have said oh it's underneath his hair but nope that was right banging in the middle of his forehead there was nothing there <laughs> they've turned up a Hawaii this guy did all right like i mean how long has he been stuck up there i mean how long was the trip everyone else is in cryo space he's just like would he have died of starvation by now i mean well that's it do we ever see, do we ever see those guys in the freezer again or do we just assume they died no we just assume he's left them to freeze to death so essentially he's murdered his friends yeah 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 But see, this film, I mean, it is about, uh, it, once it gets on here, it sort of really snowballs, but then it takes like a, almost like a fourth act when they get back to Earth. Yeah. Because it's like, essentially a three-act movie, but I think this always has a few multiple acts, you know, especially with that prologue we get at the start and stuff. Yeah, well, this is going back to the idea of it being 
essentially a trilogy in theory so you could see how they could definitely do more but then I love it how they've made the effort to cut the cord off and make sure it has an antenna I mean it'd be that futuristic I would say you wouldn't have a cord on a futuristic phone now but you've got a big aerial <laughs> I mean look at that rug I mean what the fuck is that <laughs> the funny thing is it probably was just a regular tiger rug but I thought nah tiger's not futuristic flip that oh, purple here he is here's Lee Evans <laughs> Lee Evans He's done a few films, hasn't he? But he's never really, he's never really made it like established actor, has he? He was shit hot at that time, and after this, he was shit hot because he had something about Mary, which he plays that. But then Mouse Hunt was a huge film for him. Yeah. But then doesn't he just went back? I'll give you that because he was like the prominent character in there. But everything else has always been like little side characters. Where if you think of uh, something about Mary, you know, there's probably about like twenty main characters in that film. So like, it is kind of just side characters. This but, woman has to be inspired by um, Grace Jones. Yeah. Yeah, my thoughts uh, were pretty good with that. But they, they don't look particularly any more futuristic than the modern day supermodels. I mean, I'm thinking Kanye West just might be from the future because he's a bit of fucking wacky, isn't he? <laughs> You could stick him in this film and he wouldn't stand out, would he? There's no point in shouting at him right there like that. <laughs> Hell no, I'll be fair off. Like, fuck it out. It's <laughs> a hundred miles an hour. Yeah. I mean, look at it. Definitely hair. a lot of Prince going on there, isn't it? I mean, no, I know Prince had a couple of movies like Purple Rain and Sign of the Times and all the other. The I think there's a trilogy of, but he never really. Even like Jackson, you know, they they had their tired movies and all that. But they never really went full on like fucking. No. But, I mean, Michael Jackson turned up and I can be Agent M, you know what I mean, yeah. and stuff like that. So. <laughs> well, I think with uh, Prince, he was another one who was essentially a, a difficult person to deal with. Um, I can't remember too much of the detail, but there's another story that Kevin Smith will tell you um, that he was apparently trying to set something up with Prince. And like Kevin Smith was here, he was with him for like five days and he accomplished absolutely nothing. Because like Prince would just go off on tangents and say, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, we'll do that." What I want to do now is this, and you do do some really weird stuff, and like you just couldn't really get a handle on them. But uh, I think that's why Prince would be probably would be great in this as a cameo, like as someone in the audience now. Because you know, I don't know of all the people that they just passed, because there were clearly certain people standouts. They would have been like celebrity cameos by now. Yeah. Whereas I don't know. I mean, they might have been. I just don't know who they are. <laughs> uh, but like, they just seem to be like just regular people. This screams. But, and, um, I don't know its origins or that, but it screams very um, in the fashion loop as well. If you not understand that. Well, you know, yeah. I was going to say. I'll tell you who would look perfect in this crowd right now. If it was made now, it would be um, Will Ferrell from Zoolander. Yeah. Now His this would just be like in the corner somewhere that would have worked perfect. I mean, this is on the soundtrack. This, but this song and this opera, you know, like the, it's just amazing. Yeah, and it's very, you know, she's definitely one of the. We, I mean, again, you go back to when they've just walked through the room there, and the lack of aliens in the room. Yeah, she would say she's really like the make. I think they've done that deliberately, haven't they? Though? Yeah, they really so, want to emphasise that she is an alien. She is the odd one out of all of them. But yeah, it's, it's an like amazing it's, it's song. Kind of like a very political thing there, though, because you can see that everyone trying to look alien. But is she like, famous as in the costume, but as in character? You can imagine this society. Everybody in the audience wants to be as different and as alien as it can be yeah. within the dress code and the way they look. 
I mean, it screams. Okay, it's, it screams alien with the size of the head. It screams predator with dreadlocks. It screams quite yeah. a few things. I mean, I would be pretty pissed if you turned up and you just sang the one song. That was it. <laughs> well, you know, it, uh, it has been done where people are so famous. You just you'd be happy just to hear a couple of minutes. Welcome to the one hit wonder. Yeah, I mean, look at that. I mean, don't get me wrong, mate. If Chesney Hawks was long in Stanley, I'd be there to see him. Uh, Chesney Hawks, by the way, has just appeared on uh, Straight uh, VHS podcast with Rob Lane, who appears with us in the tournament video. Um, really? That's his new podcast out tonight, so that's a weird little uh, experience, eh? Well, he's the one and only. Uh, the Volta range on this is amazing. She must have been a professional singer. I don't know, like, every time I see it, I think of uh, Jennifer Garner. I think it looks like. Aye. Boom. Oh, there's another spark to the gut. That's it. I mean, the the leaps and boundaries... If you, for example, have green blood and a zombie to red blood, it's a mental man. She's been stood in that hallway too long now, though. I mean, what's she essentially doing? Well, that's that's the edit, that, though. That's the um, choice of ending that. So, in theory, yeah. this scene, whatever well, took place before the fucking... It's just how it's coming, the edit, you know what I mean? I'm going to say there'd be at least about half an hour pass between the first time you see her and now. Obviously, we know that's not the case in editing, but just the way it looks, it's just like, nah, could have put her in a different room. And then she just bursts out into this, like, weird dig. And then it's edit. The fight scene's quite edited to the, the, the hit, like, so, boosh. Well, as it happens, um one of the infamous trivia facts that I have here. If you see her do any high kick, it's a stunt leg. Apparently the uh, she was able to do a little bit of training for the film, but wasn't enough to actually get good enough to be able to give a high kick. So apparently every time she did a high kick, it's actually somebody else's leg. That there would be one of them, probably. Her head just goes raw. It's so catchy, the song. <laughs> but unlike Bruce Willis, she gets absolutely mauled in the air vent. <laughs> That's definitely one of the masks that doesn't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> right, the, the whole end of it there when she flicks her arms up and that like what's going on eh? Yeah. I mean I say I mean they are giving a stout applause the things have gone down, so maybe she was gonna do another song, but you know, she gets shot so she doesn't, so True. But, you know, like I said, uh, editing in it, she could be singing a song right now. Nope, she's not. No, she's definitely done. <laughs> then Gary Oldman, there's no really, like, final run-in with the villain, is it? Gary Oldman's... Yeah. Kills himself by what mistake. I mean. like, you would think the natural order would be Gary Oldman and say Bruce Willis, you know, in battle sort of thing. Or at least one with her, like properly, but it just seemed to be a. Uh, I don't know. I think they just take every character as serious as they are. So like, he's not really the. I don't know the big bad villain. He just happened to be almost like a politician, and he just happened to be someone who had got power. But it isn't necessarily the big bad. Ah, <laughs> oh, them 
Where's Steven Seagal? Under siege now. Ah, <laughs> uh, there's a man. Have you done a, um, what the fuck was him? Who's that? Seagal. Oh, no. I wouldn't want to put myself through that much torture. Uh, <laughs> fuck that. I'll no, watch, no, um, it's funny enough, the uh, the night I was eating all the carrots, I woke up and Under Siege was on the telly. I was like, oh, not again. <laughs> Just never, I never remember putting it on, but there we go, Under Siege. Um, yeah. I mean, I watched uh, Out for Justice, I watched recently um, Mark for Death, and so that era of ones are really good movies, but yeah, after that, I've got no time for it. Like, uh, I love it how she got perfectly oh. shot in belly of that she's but like how has she got all them stones in there how she's obviously naked I mean don't know but it was very conveniently in her belly button yep it's almost like they said if I rip her shirt open that would look like a wound Twenty minutes. So, um, you haven't done your taglines. I have not done your taglines. Now we are missing Mr. Paul Ray, who is having some vacation time. Oh, he's not alive. He's not frozen in the fridge. He's there. He's escaped. <laughs> I, just, I, don't, I was thinking, you know, I was thinking, we're going to see him again. We will get round to doing. Um, Jaws too. We were scheduled to do that a couple of weeks ago, but it fell through. I can't remember what happened. Um, I'm actually feeling not too bad with COVID. Actually, on this, I thought I would be coughing and sputting, but. Um, hey, well, if you've had your jab and everything, mate, because obviously I've uh, I decided to do a two times. You see, so when I had it the first time in the second lockdown, I was not worth anything for anyone. Where the second time I got it round, it was if, it, if COVID wasn't a real thing, I would have just told people I had a cold. Yeah. It wasn't too bad at all, but obviously it's uh, each to the run. So I was just looking there because uh, I'm transferring February now. So February um, last year, which would have been a year gone last month, um, we did all four Batmans, Biodome, Broken Arrow was recorded, um, Python 1 and 2, some of these would have been me on my own, like. We did Time Cop a year ago. No, we uh we did Time Cop um and that that was when we didn't know when it was gonna stop, didn't we? So we just because yeah. I remember when we did Biodome we were like, Oh we'll get that down while we're in bi uh lockdown and it took a while, so I think the Nine Jones wouldn't be too far behind that. No. So as far as tagline go, it has got a couple. Um, um, so I'm not sure if I like any of them, but we'll go with them. Uh, so one is, it must be found, but the S in the word must is a number five. No. Uh, yeah, then there, were, there is no future without it. Obviously, you didn't really then Jenny in the film. Uh, probably the most useful one, 250 years in the future, all will be lost unless the fifth element is found. Kind of tells you about the film, but not too much. But also uh, 300 years as well at the start, so. Yeah, and then you've got the fifth is life, which is stupid. Um, is it love or li- is it love or live? That doesn't make sense to me. Why? Is that a reference? My to something there. Yeah. Is it love or live? Unless it's meant to be life and then doing this, spelled it wrong, but it be in there an F. Which is quite possible because the V and F are quite close to the, uh, the typer. Typer, keyboard, that's the word I'm looking It's for. one of those things where uh, you, you look at a message and you read a bat and you go, yeah, that makes sense. Or you look at a post and you go, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. You post it or you yeah. send it and instantly read a bat and go, that doesn't make sense. No. Nah. <laughs> uh, and the last one, of course, time is not important, only life is important. So not the best of taglines for this time round, but. Again, I feel like we could do a top 10 or top worst taglines and there's some pretty special ones out there. Like. The greatest tagline ever is just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water. Yeah. 
it is yeah. by by far like one of the most best taglines. I mean, just looking around the editing room here, you've got Waterworld beyond the horizon lies the secret to a new beginning. I mean, that's our ingoing joke here. Can we get Waterworld into it? Uh, every time. <laughs> um, Predator doesn't but then, have like, one. Um, only um, what is it? Alien. Uh... In well, space, only uh, no space, one can, no can hear you scream. Great tagline. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> I've had a little bit because I always remember like, literally proper belly laughing. Um, because it literally, I hated the idea of the film. I've never watched it. I don't know if you ever did. Um, but the tagline just said, I can say it, everything. So it's a 2012 Total Recall. Oh, yeah. And one of the taglines is, what is real? And I was just like, what the fuck? It's just, that's it, what is real with a question mark? It was just like, I mean, don't get me wrong, some of them are not too bad. Is it real or is it recall? I get it, you know. Real I mean, or dream. I love um, Total Recall. We've done the podcast. The whole idea is what is real. It's like someone got paid to put that on there. I mean, we we did the podcast of Total Recall randomly one day, and um, we did. I really enjoyed that film, and it was great to just do it. Um, but I've probably told you this a million times before. The remake of Total Recall, uh, I mean, it is visually stunning. It tries to completely twist it, but then not leave you so like, what the fuck happened? Like the first one did. Um, but the best thing about that movie, Kate Beckinsale sliding along that floor and teabagging him in the face, is one of the greatest things <laughs> I've seen on camera. I mean, she is, she is just amazing. You need to follow her on Instagram. She just looks like she's just got this, like, ha-ha, I'm in it for a laugh kind of look, but then obviously looking so amazing that she did. But that bit where she just slides on the floor, bang. Hey, listen, if a woman's going to take me out, I wouldn't much appreciate it if she slides on the floor and teabags. Huh? Although, her biggest franchise, I've never seen a single one. Underworld. Underworld. Yeah, I mean... The first one, it was good, and then, I mean, she's not in the third one. Technically, she is sort of, and it's still homegrown. Yeah. But um, one of her, my favorite films of hers, Whiteout. No, I've never seen that. Uh, it's sort of like, um, you know, it's got love for the thing. It, it's all about a murder that happens on the, um, like, an outpost in the cold, and there's a murder, and there's a big conspiracy about who did it, and. Um, she's like the uh, federal marshal on the location, so it's quite an interesting story. Like, yeah, is she the missus out of Click? Yeah, but she's also in uh, uh, absolutely everything with Simon Pegg and that. She's done a lot, like. Yeah, so I'm going to say uh, that is kind of a very similar type of role in film, but uh, no, just for some reason, as I think of her, I think of Click all the time. As you think. That's very clever of you, Adam. I mean, you're not an ugly man, but you always seem to give yourself very, oh, very attractive wives in your film. Uh, Serendipity as well. I think that's an amazing film. It definitely should be put up there as a like a Christmas classic. I think it's a great story, like all set right. around like the Christmas period. Have you seen that before? No, not I much. highly recommend that one to you. I know you're going to tell us to fuck off after I recommend it, Ravenous. <laughs> well, your, your track record is the Gucci Strangler. And we've also got, um, what do you call it, um, Under the Silver Lake, which you're kind of one in one. I enjoyed Under the Silver Lake, but Gucci Strangler. I mean, on a certain level, I probably can admit that I enjoyed it a bit, but it's just fucking out there, and I just realised that's what your MO is. If you're watching a film, it's literally what you call your video, weird, wacky, wonderful, probably. <laughs> Lee Evans got the shakes on. He's a great. I mean, he's fucking fantastic in um, uh, Mouse Hunt, like. Yes. But it's um, it's kind of one of those things where does he like the Hollywood system? Obviously not. <coughs> well, he doesn't like. He doesn't like performing. You know what I mean? It's a. Uh, it's always been a problem with him. I mean, obviously, he makes it part of his act when he talks about like how he, he sweats so much on stage, he, he hates performing because he gets like stage fright and everything. But obviously, he's been lucky enough to be able to make it a part of his character. Um, but at the same time, I can imagine, like I say, he must have done so much in terms of writing and stuff like that. Yeah. So he probably doesn't need to be a movie star to be kind of up there and successful. That old chestnut there, just walking, shooting straight between the eyes, boom. Of course. Um, 
last thing he ever did as an actor was 2009, which is uh, Doctor Who. Uh, before that was like with Midlands, wasn't it? I mean, he's been on. I mean, he's retired now from stand up, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, well, because I think he's pretty much retired to him. I have a look to see what he's writing. Uh, no, his last writing was his last show, which was 2014. He sweated the fuck on stage, like, didn't he? Oh, right. I think he just he was fortunate to make it part of his character, because, like I mean, the fact that he wears a shirt and a suit. And you could see it coming through the suit, see it a lot, how much a fucking a person's sweat like. But great live, so I'm live in Newcastle. It was actually quite funny because um, he had this whole thing set up. So like, basically, if you've ever watched a live show in the Evans, he always does a big piece at the end. It's normally like in the form of a song or something like that. Yeah. And uh, obviously, he was in Newcastle a few years ago, and we um, and he turned around and said, "You know what it is." I've set up this massive, elaborate musical thing at the end, been working on it for months, but I've been in Newcastle for 48 hours, and all I've heard is, will you please do the Greg song? <laughs> He's just like, so I've completely scrapped the musical, I'm just going to give you my Greg's one, and uh, he does the Greg's, and then he ended up doing another for even the after me as well at the end, which was always very fun. I've just had a missed phone call from uh, Sarah, who I used to go to school with, and she was just like, what was this band called? And I was like, Waterhouse. And it was just like so random if you heard me phone people there. <laughs> well, you just knew it took away as well. You didn't have to look it up. Well, I still haven't mastered, obviously. This is still one of the very few podcasts we've done where it's been on Apple um, on my iPhone. And um, like on the old button, like, on the old phone, I could just switch off like income and calls and stuff. But uh as I yeah. said, we were going to do one tomorrow. I mean, we still probably could, just depends on how my day goes. Like, but it's one of those things yeah. where sometimes, like, when someone phones you on the main line, it cuts off WhatsApp. But oh yeah, yeah. And there we well, go. I, I, I took me years to figure out what it was because I'm uh, I get quite a lot of messages through uh, Messenger. So whenever I do podcast like this, I'm on my phone, um, and it took me ages to figure out how to make it so it didn't make a noise. But even though it's not making a noise out loud because I've got my headphones on, it still made like a bit of a rumbling noise. It was, like, I think on one of the last podcasts, I was just like, shit, I think like, message 20. So, I don't think it was very obvious, but to me it was, and I was just like, I better figure out and make that silence. So, like, I mean, they're here. I mean, Gary Orman's just really marching to his own death by his own hand, really, and he's not really. I think he's not doing anything, but he's doing a lot of, you know what I mean? And, and he actually solves the bomb, but the guy gets his revenge by like the other bomb being randomly found in it. Yeah. The thing is, though, not in a negative way, but at this point in the film, do we need Chris Tucker? It seems strange that he like he's kind of stuck with him. I mean, he could have been like again. Lee Evans is now out of the picture. He's gone and dusted. But now, like yeah. you know, like there's quite a lot of people has gone down there, and we need four people for the four elements, really. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's a good one. But yeah, I mean, you think you would have a remote control, not a fancy little card? <laughs> I mean, the amount of stuff Brick can do via a fucking watch now. Do you know what I mean? The leaps and boundaries. Uh, people pay for shit on all sorts of watches now. It's just like, oh, here we go. Have I told you about? Have I told you about that guy at work who was just staring at the car machine one day? No. So I, was, I, I went, oh, you know, the same routine. The guy's ready to pay, and he, he didn't even bat an eyelid. You know what I mean? It's like you know when you say all right to somebody, he just didn't even bat an eyelid. He's just, you know, looking at the car machine. And I swung the till for people listening at home. The the the, <laughs> the screen blocks my view from someone's card. No, it's just the way the the things look up. You know what I mean? And yeah. I just switched, I just moved the screen to see what he's doing because, like, I went, Oh, there you go, mate. It's ready for you to pay. Tap, pay, we whatever. And uh, I went, What are you doing? He went, Well, I've got facial recognition. I went, Not on the car machine, you don't, mate. <laughs> and he looked at us and he was like looking at me. And the car machine's not like new, it's really like the average car machine where, you know, it's got an icon for wireless. 
and he was like and it, he just took a minute and then you see the penny drop and he reached into his pocket got his phone looked at his phone and then put his phone on and it went beep and then he was off didn't even say bye you know just like I was like oh fucking idiot <laughs> It's like, Excellent. it's like just after Can lockdown when the, the guy was like oh do you do click and collect I went aye and he looked at us and he had it in his hand and he looked at me he looked at his hand then looked at his hand again and went can I just buy this now like and I went yes he went alright there you go then and I'm like fuck me I like, talk about being in the house too long that's it it's like when someone comes in and they're like um When's such and such as new album coming out? And I went, you've got all the way here and you've had multiple times to check on your own phone as a massive diehard fan to ask me. I mean, now, I mean, yeah. one point we were the fountain of knowledge, do you know what I mean? I mean, there's still stuff that you're like, oh, yeah. fucking hell. Like, you know, Crystal Lake Memories is coming out on Blu-ray and we might have the yeah. brief heads up. But like, like when someone comes in and goes, Cliff Richard has got a new album out. I was like, no. Or the... <laughs> Oh, they'll be like, such and such has got a new film out. He's, he's definitely dead and been dead a long time. No. Yeah. Well, they're not famous, there are a lot of artists like that. Well, they're the one, actually, I think Tupac will listen to an album every now and again. <laughs> People still holding on to the thing that he's uh, recorded. He's locked up somewhere, hiding in a little attic. Tell you what, though, I mean, surprised someone. I mean, it would have to be animated and it would be a likeness right nightmare. But like, if they did sort of a double team spoof of like, like celebrity people living on an island, and like you know, you basically sign up, and like you're out of the mainstream, you're out of everything, everything's paid for. You yeah. do what you want on this island, but we have all your rights, your music, and all that. Uh, it was such a funny comedy skit, like. Well, this is it. Can I honestly think, and I'm not going to go into a conspiracy level that he actually is, but if anyone, if it was going to be anyone, I'd say it would be him. But I honestly think. The likes of someone like Elvis might have just disappeared off the face of the earth. Just but people are never going to... He was so fucking shit hot. Like, I could just totally imagine him going, listen, just, I'm going to sell everything and I just want to just disappear. Well, it's like mega fame. Totally imagine that. It's like Bubba Hope Tep. It's people who have mega fame yeah. and they don't want it anymore. Um, it's yeah. like overnight success and it's mega fame and you've got all the people now who, you know, like... I mean, I've been filming life longer than I can fucking now remember, and I just make stuff for. I don't care who watches. I don't care about anything like that. But like, some people will go above and beyond and be want to be famous, and it's a brief crack of light now. But people who reach mega, like stardom, Michael Jackson, um, and yeah. all these people. But then suddenly, when they die, people don't want to believe that they're dead. I mean, no one's going to go, "Oh yeah, Elvis died in the toilet." No, he didn't. Like Michael Jackson, his doctor killed him. Well, no, he didn't. He just body give up or whatever like there's all yeah. the conspiracies you know what I mean and it's like Kirk Cobain like had enough one day and shot himself in the head and like no he didn't he was murdered and you think so, well was he really or did he just have enough one day in the school you know because again with people who again suicide and all that you just never know do you normally the people yeah. you didn't really suspect are the people who just suddenly like fucking hell didn't see that coming well, there's a lot of signs, there's a lot of telltale signs out there, you know, like when they're talking about, um, what do they call him, from Lincoln Park? Oh, Chester. Yeah, because obviously he like, had the, the most kind of common, kind of what generally most people would be surprised about, but it's actually really common. Like when people turn around and said, oh, he was so like happy in the like, last week and everyone thought he was doing so much better and stuff like that. There's a lot of factors going into that, like the fact that it's because he probably planned it. He probably oh, sitting there going, you know, I know next week I'll not be here. And that's what makes them really happy. And that's what makes so when you see people who like commit suicide, it's the ones who are like, they were miserable and then they commit suicide. It's just like, well, it's not as common as you would think. It's more common, more common that people become incredibly happy and elated and then suddenly they'll commit suicide i mean i was sitting there the other week and i had like five or six screens to look at i was heavily and i think at that time blood sport and blood sport was taking a long time to save and you know it was like final cut so i was trying to like fucking finally do the t's and cross everything and get it right and i remember i mean i'm watching mork and mindy at the minute when i'm in and um, there was just a still of uh, Ron Williams and he was, I mean, we're totally off track by the film, but I'll wrap this up quick. Um, and I just remember being like nicely spaced out and just chilled and all that. And I just paused the picture on Ron Williams 
and just he was just staring up at the ceiling. It was a nice shot, and I remember just leaving that on all night. And it, it was, it, it was, you know, I was looking at it and going, my God, like one day you just decide to, uh, like, you have that much fame, stardom, and you have that much range, but like, as an all an actor, or like, why? And then just questions you just never know, like, so. Yeah. Another comedian like that. Another, they generally hide behind the mask, I think. Like, that's why a lot of people classify, like, Jim Carrey, it's just wacky and out there now, and I think, I don't think he is. I think he just spent so long playing the character that we all liked and now he's just like it's a, oh, yeah. is. no that's not how life works it's it's a lot harder now to keep up um to not have an act like at the end yeah. of the day tom green is completely wacky but he's still wacky when you watch him instagram um but back then you didn't have the social media and all that what you presented on television was enough do you know what I mean? Oh fucking hell! Yeah. And, you, and celebrities had that kind of hedonism, but now people turn yeah. up and like, you know, they get caught on a bad day, a bad day yeah. that they've probably had bad news. They've been harassed, and it just takes that one person to catch them with a phone, and they're like, yeah. it goes fucking viral, and they're like, how the fuck am I going to turn up, like, recover from this? Do you know what? I mean? yeah. No one's ever going to know, like, oh, like bad, bad news, bad news, bad news, bad, bad news. Uh, and like I've been nice to everyone all day and then all of a sudden it's the internet sensation I'm just like fuck you put your camera down or whatever you know what I mean <laughs> yeah so back to the movie um, so the stones are starting to activate the stones are not activated now um, he has his shining moment as he's almost been useful throughout the movie um, yeah. he discovers like they need the elements and obviously pre-set up in the movie that Corbin has one match left. Yes, that's it. No one's got a supersonic lighter, you know what I mean? Chris Tucker looks like he's got a lightsaber behind him. Um, <laughs> he did, yeah. I mean, they're, they're able to travel across space, super times, but lovely CGI here, though. I love this, yeah. I think what was an interesting team, which seemed almost like a throwaway. Um... But I thought it was quite an interesting thing to do is um, have um, Mila uh, type in war and then yeah. get an instant, you know, kind of education on like war in on planet Earth for the last couple of generations. And I felt like it had such an effect on our character, but at the same time, I feel like it was a bit of a throwaway because it hadn't really amounted to anything. Well, that's it. I mean, you think that, I mean, again, it's... I agree with you that it was possibly written as a trilogy originally and then obviously crunched right down into one movie. Um, but there's a lot of things that, I don't know, it's, it just seems like cliches. Not as cliche as the other night I watched um, Spider-Man 3 and fuck me, you can see that <laughs> film coming a mile away. Every, like, yeah. you can just see like you can almost see the script paper when that's playing <laughs> I mean it might just be me there but I don't know if that was maybe multiple takes but it definitely definitely looked like that match that he had at heard against struck <laughs> it was fucking black unless they can just turn on and go oh no 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 that's what futuristic matches look like. And uh, they, they made the, the effort with the future. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, they made the futuristic effort with the cigarettes, but not the matches. Yeah. <laughs> probably the one only bit of wood we've seen. <laughs> True, yeah, probably is, actually, yeah. Was it general, like, uh... I mean the song as well, um, which plays at the end. Uh, it's a very powerful anthem, but obviously not known. Um, as I say, it's a song that's used at the very end. Um, yeah. So obviously that song was written with the idea because the song's totally a love song. Um, yeah, yeah. But obviously they were still looking for that anthem, that theme. But I think Eric Sara's music is definitely class. I love it. Yeah. Give me a kiss. But, like, that's the thing about this film. So as much as I enjoy it and as much as it's got fun elements to it, no pun intended, uh, but there's literally next to no chemistry with them two. 
that line no. did not sell it. I love you. It's just like, okay, mate, you tried to kiss her when she was passed out, and she's not giving you any indication that she even remotely likes you throughout the entire film. So this whole ending coming down to the idea of being the, oh, I love you, I just feel like that's where I kind of went, ah, uh, that didn't work. Boom, there's some colour effects. It looks very good on the old Blu-ray. I'm sorry, are you watching Blu-ray as well, yeah? Yeah, yeah, we'll watch the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I have become one of those people, you know, I didn't say I would be, and I've got a, an extensive collection, but sometimes I'll look at my shelf and go, oh, I fancy watching that, and I'll sometimes go, I'll just check and see if it's on a streaming site so I don't have to get up. <laughs> That's it. I mean, last week before I uh, tested positive, um, um, the night before Brit tested positive, I was like, oh, there's me on the couch. And um, <laughs> you're going you're gonna to fucking laugh at me here, mate. So I sat down right. in a PlayStation on and on the PlayStation. I've got Amazon, I've got Apple TV, I've yeah. got Netflix, and I've got Disney Plus, and, um, and I've got YouTube. And I decided to watch the X Files movie. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's like, I mean, it's not long since I've seen it, I don't know why, but like, I remember watching the first five minutes and just been out for the count. But like, right. Even though I had all that opportunity to watch something random new I've never seen before, yeah, X Files. Yeah, yeah. You go straight for X Files. But yeah, I had two I nights. Mean, I've done that, man. Don't get me wrong, really. I think Amazon Prime quite good for it. Where I'll often deliberately go because I want to watch like an ancient film. Like a couple of weeks ago, I just had a proper eighties vibe going for myself, and I just thought I want to watch something that's so like eighties vibe that it just makes all the sense in the world just to. Like, there's so many new things that I still haven't watched, but there's the one I was wondering, I was going to watch the other night, I forget what it's called now, I think Winfall, it's uh, Ben Affleck. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there's another one which I think, I don't know, it's been given some mixed reviews, but it's always like when Ben Affleck does a film with somebody he did an, or he was in actual relationship when he did it, never seemed to work out very well for him. Tommy Tiny Lister with his big uh, sp- acting at the end there as Bruce yeah, Willis and too. Mila Malokovic have sex in the cryo tube that's for sale. Well I mean it looks like a pretty comfortable place to do it. Well not really. Right. I mean get on top that's well, not going to happen in there like. Well no well, I think the point being is if you're going to have two people in there that seems to be the one thing you're going to end up doing. <laughs> I think that's, that's what my brain went is. Like it'll, it'll make sense to have sex in there. So, the song hits now. Um, yep. Right Tiny on, Lister Tricky. Jr. So, Tricky is a rapper, isn't he? Huh? Yeah. Um, so, looking back at it, um, what we're going to do, how, how, how many elements out of ten there? We... I think that's the way you gotta go. Yeah, I mean, I, what else would you go with? You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna be uh, really cheesy and say five fifth elements. Um, You're gonna go five fifth elements. Right? It is. I'm gonna agree with you on the fact that it almost feels like there's multiple directions of a trilogy there, um, and nowadays it would try to do that, and then we wouldn't get the third instalment or some shit. So they've kind of compacted it. Um, Nostalgia-wise, I just still remember seeing them subways in London and seeing how, you know, I couldn't wait for this movie to come out. Um, especially at the time as well, because it was all total film. Um, and not long being a big thing. Um, I remember seeing total film in a newsstand with Mel Gibson on the front cover for Ransom. And like the way Total Film originally presented itself as a magazine, and there would, you know, there was some like some drastically, really badly changed with Total Film, and a film magazine now as well. It's all news as soon as it hits the press stand. You know what I mean? Um, unless they do exclusives and like that's where the content. But like, I was hyped for that. I was hyped for all these movies. Um, and I remember seeing it, and like, I'm not a huge sci-fi guy. Um, I do have a sci-fi in the Z department now, but it's more like, um, maybe it's not my two go-to, um, 
big fan of Bruce Willis. I think this is Bruce Willis a total peak, but I also think it's Bruce Willis where he's reaching, he's adventuring. Uh, 12 Monkeys was so close to us where he was trying to shake off the John McClane, but he still did a Die Hard 3, which to me is the second best of the Die Hard movies. Um, um, I think it's a very weird ensemble cast. I think it's a walk of cast over loads of different lives. I think the CGI has turned up well. Um, the score's fantastic. Um, I've already said five fifth elements to coin for the thing, but um, yeah. I do think there's a lot of let down. I think it's a fa it's, I think it's it got a fourth act when it doesn't need a fourth act. Um, it could be tied in, so this could be tri trimmed down. But I want to pass you on the car because I even need a sneeze, cough, or cry. I'm gonna say I can be. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> with pretty much everything you said. I did all. I did all right. Um, Oh, it looks amazing, especially on Blu-ray. Um, it has great soundtrack. The score is brilliant. I mean, oh. yeah, you see, it's a wacky cast, but yeah, I just feel like he was given an opportunity where it almost felt like someone turned around and said, "Just do what you want. I'm not going to get involved. There's your money. I wanted to see what you come up with." And obviously, there's a lot of stuff like that works really well for that. But like you say. There's a lot of stuff that didn't work and in the fourth act and you know it just felt like you know the, the whole I love you thing when, even when I watched it from the first time to watching it tonight it just feels really out of the out of the sort of movie kind of element again no, 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 no pun intended um, but I would say yeah I mean as much as I was like to go and say you know eighth element to five element but yeah I'm going to say six I feel like it earned six because it lives up to what it was in, what, 1997. You know, there's not many films that in the 90s I see CGI that worked as well. But it didn't always work. Like I say, we saw some Bishop that didn't look quite as, um, as realistic. But now I think six is a fairly standard um, kind of match for it. I mean, Sorry, the mate, um... was great. Mark Manchina, yeah. Mark Manchina actually worked on the score as well. So sorry, yeah. <laughs> his name no, just went yeah. past. Uh, but no, I think I'm just. I, I feel like I'm just repeating you. So therefore, yeah, I would say I'm gonna go with six. I feel like uh, I love playing with studios. You're right. Uh, so there you go. So definitely our uh, next door went to off probably. Uh, um, but yeah, it's a great film. Uh, I mean, I recommend anyone who would watch this who's a sci-fi fan. I mean, I'm definitely more sci-fi than you are uh, when it comes to uh, the love of movies. So I feel like that's where my love for it yeah, expand a little bit more. If you were gonna, if, if you're gonna do a top ten of sci-fi movies and set to somebody, here's sci-fi because if you said sci-fi to somebody, they're instantly gonna think Star Wars and it's gonna think Star Trek. Which is the massive, which is the massive backbone of that entire culture, um, yeah. And like, I would put Fifth Element in there. Um, it, it's in there uh, because there's nothing like Fifth Element. That's what I, I think I like. When um, you consider, like, if I do a top ten sci-fi, in my head, I won't, I'm going to put maybe first ten. I mean, first five are going to be my favourites. Are going to be the things that I love the most. But then I will respect films that I don't particularly love, but I totally get why they're popular and why people like them. But when you consider like how many different genres of sci-fi you can get, like you can get aliens, you know that's sci-fi horror, you yeah. know. Uh, whereas you know Star Wars is more sci-fi um, soap opera. This definitely works to me as a sci-fi comic book, and to me it really, like I say, it definitely a top ten for me. Yeah, I mean it's it's one it. I mean. The the idea would be like the, he's five like if you had f ten films you could um, have for like sci-fi and you weren't a sci-fi fan you said well look he's five of your favourites but then he has five that are easy watchable and enjoyable as a like a sci-fi film that really like if you went to the pictures a vast amount of audience that aren't sci-fi fans would love it. Yeah, it has yeah. a lot of humour. The visuals look great for when they did. I think like the ensemble cast is another big thing. Um, but there's a room. There's a lot of error in it, and there's a lot of stuff where it's cool, and, and it's still like this screams as is CGI is here. Let's have fun with it. The sky's the limit. Um, 
but it oh, it sort of jumps ahead but then sort of reins itself back we talked about the bit where they're on the ship and it's the paradise you know there's one fucking alien and it's on the stage the other aliens are yeah, terrorists yeah, exactly, but like yeah. you would think that if you had a result like that it would be like oh he he's a like george lucas well, you know you know i'm not a big star wars fan but that whole scene in the bar when he has all the bands and that playing and it's just yeah, yeah. fucking chaos filled do you know what i mean yeah. it's taking there's advantage not a of that person looks the same exactly so well this has been the podcast for fifth element um i've enjoyed this today it's been great to do it as i say i am still i am now suffering um as you can probably hear um i did i did really good i only coughed once so it looks like i'm on the up um well listen we didn't plan it i mean obviously for all it is um it will come off in the video as as something that we would do tonight but it's something that we decided to do like what two or three hours ago sort of thing yeah it was your call as well a a, a fun let's have a a, a random film watch and that thing yeah I mean it was this or Con Air so Con Air will definitely be on the cards now Um, Super Mario Brothers and Bad Boys were two we were trying to do a couple of weeks ago but again at the moment see see where Mr Paul Reed is and we'll try and get uh, Joe's two done because I think that's uh, definitely to be on the card but like Obviously, like I say, water world. I mean, I think we would joke about that, but, uh, you know, one day, one day it's going to happen. I don't know if water world should be, like, breaking in the parts or something like that, but then we'll never get the second part recorded, or no one will fucking remember what's going on. Um, yeah. Gone are the days of doing two podcasts back to back, that's for sure. Right, I'm going to wrap this mean, up. We can use camera magic, you know, we can do sit it all in one night and then. You can just do your editing. Oh, I believe in me. <laughs> right, thanks for listening, everyone. Goodbye for now. Ciao.